So uh, if you take a look, sprays. Now, as I say in every demo, I always like to show the storage when I start. Uh, in my studio, I have my products stored in a vintage hardware spinner, so they are at the ready. But I know that everybody has a different creative space. And so I always like to show the storage tin. These storage tins from Ranger for the sprays are really great. They are stackable, right? So you can see they kind of, I'm not going to say they lock together, but there is that little lip right there that makes these stackable. They have that clear top. I would recommend keeping your sprays stored upright uh, just for the fact that it is a fluid medium. And so if you store them on the sides, I don't know, I just wouldn't trust that overnight. I, I think that if you're working with them and you want them on their sides for whatever reason, fine, but I would store these upright. Now for the demo purposes, I'll just tell you how I have my tins set up. Uh, I have one for colors and I do have a set of storage tins, not just for demo purposes, but because if I do travel or if I go to a show and I want to bring uh, a certain selection, to me, these three tins work for me because like in, in one set, I have just my uh, Distress Spray Stain. So the Spray Stain, of course, here, let me get this to focus. There we go. Um, the Spray Stain is a fluid version of our Distress Ink. So these are gonna be the translucent dye. So I have those. And these are my colors, kind of Roy G. Biv, pink, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, just a selection. There's only 12 in this tin right out of the palette so it was tough to choose uh, then in another tin i have my oxides right so the oxide same thing this is going to be a fluid sprayable version of a distress oxide pad so all the great properties that the pads do uh, we can get from the spray but a little bit more versatility from the spray and you'll see and then in one it is my box of grunge because there are things that i like from a a grunge perspective. So I kind of keep a little grunge box. And in here, I've got my browns and grays and let me pull this out, uh, hickory smokes. These are the sprays. And then I have some of my favorite colors in oxide, like old paper, black soot, I'm sure right here, uh, favorite of many. If you've seen an earlier demo, this is frayed burlap oxide spray. And then there's some other sprays to understand. We do have picket fence in a spray stain, right? So picket fence, of course, is just going to be white. And that's going to give you a nice milky effect if you mixed it with your stains, or it's going to give you a more opaque, softer pastel color if you mixed it with the oxides. There are metallic sprays. Now these guys are very, very different. I kind of keep them in a class all, all on their own because they are more like a metallic spray paint. They are a bit thicker than either the oxide or the spray stains. These guys are completely opaque. All right, so these, although we, we classify them as a spray stain, uh, technically they really aren't, but we didn't have any other place to put them. Um, but these are going to be an opaque spray because they have a lot of metallic to it. It doesn't mean that you can't mix it with the color to get that metallic to spread out, but you need to kind of remember that. These guys also really have a tendency to clog up when you're, when you're done using them. So just like the resist spray, uh, we wanna clean that out. And we're gonna get into resist spray and some mica sprays a little bit later because I did wanna talk about different sprays. But for now, we're going to go in and just work with sprays. So I'm gonna have my tins off to the side if I can. I'll pull, I'm just gonna pull these colors out for now. I just think it's gonna be easier if I empty the tins to start. Uh, the, the downside for me, maybe I'll be able to put it over here. Okay, let's see. I just hope that, I mean, I've got the lid hanging off of my table. That's never going to work. I'm just going to get my sprays out right now, you guys, just to save myself uh, some some grief. All right. A couple of the things about tins that I'll just talk about while I'm doing this, just to fill up some airspace. These things, these are always removable. These little inserts, they're just plastic. So another thing to keep in mind uh, when it comes to any storage tins, whether it's the spray or alcohol inks or ink pads, you know, there's a lot of times that I'll use tins for other things, you know, for uh, ephemera or paper dolls or just things that I'm looking for storage. It's another cool thing about the storage tin because I love the window. So if you have other products, maybe you have other sprays or something that doesn't necessarily fit that insert, you can just pop that out and still use this tin for other things. So think about that in your studio, you know, from a height perspective, that's all you have to worry about fitting in the tin, like the mini ink pads, the crayon tins. If you've seen the videos, you know I use those tins a lot for other things. Okay, so I've got my oxides here. I've got my sprays here. I'm going to move them off just so, so you get it. So let's talk about sprays. Now, because sprays are a fluid colorant, okay, you need to remember that it's going to get a little messy. Okay, It's just the nature of the product. And some people, uh, and I'll, like I said before, 
Um, I wasn't really into sprays much because that's all I thought of them. I thought, man, that is just a hot mess. I can't control it. I get stuff everywhere. And that is true. You have to be aware of that, that sprays are designed, well, to spray. They're going to go places. But there are products that you can use when you're working with your sprays. And I'll just share how, how I use mine. First of all, I work on a media mat or some place that's covered. If I am going to do a lot of spraying, I even put... Um, a bit of like butcher paper down you just get paper on a roll and you can cover your space there because there is going to be overspray or as you've seen in videos i love to use my splat box okay and the splat box is really important i'll just show you real quick because i don't think i've ever shown uh the splat box itself how it comes <clears throat> because you can still use a, your own cardboard box there's there's no there's nothing wrong with that but here's how the splat box come it does it comes flat okay but the cool thing about this box, like when you open it, right, it is designed to easily just go together. So you open this part up. It's got these little flaps here. It's got these, this little area that you stand up. It's got these. So it's like a triple wall. If you see, it's got that inside piece and then it's got an outer piece and another piece here. It's got these little perforation marks that are designed to go around the thickness of this wall. I'm just trying to do this without and staying in frame. Then it's got the little tab down there. You see that? And that just pops into that little channel and you wrap this around and that pops into that channel. And that's it. Your splat box is made. But I wanted these thicker walls again because I wanted a box that I can spray into. So this angle was really important. And so I know people, you know, obviously you can just cut a box and work into it. But if you're going to do that, you really want to construct something that's going to have this angular play because if everything is always from the top, you're really missing different pattern and movement because everything is always raining down from the top. So having this angle allows me to go in from the side and it also allows me to stand it up this way if I wanted to spray and have something drip down. So that's how it is. Can you take this apart? Absolutely, you know, you can press down to get that tab to unlock and you can refold it if you want. But honestly, when I have my splat box, once I put it together, I just use it, okay? So that's just how it is. So I do work in the splat box. Sometimes I'll work in the splat box by itself. A lot of times when I'm working with sprays because it's very juicy, I will use paper towels or you can use other paper that maybe you're a junk journaler, an art journaler, something that you wanna mop up your color that you're gonna use for another project, you do you, okay? Some people really believe uh, in working on other background paper that they can incorporate, no problem. This is just what I do. So I use that, especially if I'm gonna be doing a lot of juicy sprays. All right, so when it comes to the sprays, let's just talk about the differences just in, in two products, right? So we talk about spray stain and oxide spray. And these two are just as different as a distress ink pad or distress oxide. And we know from last week that using them together is what creates magic. We also know that if you work with spray stain, this is going to give you the most intense color because it is a dye. And this is going to give you a combination of dye and pigment. And together they make really cool effects. We're just gonna start with some simple backgrounds and then we'll, we'll work from there, okay? So I'm gonna take out my splat box. So same papers apply, right? If I'm working with it, um, I've got just a whole assortment of paper, everything from distressed watercolor cardstock that's going to give me uh, that nice movement or watercolory effect. Mixed media heavy stock, if I wanna create uh, more mixed media or drippy effects. Also white heavy stock, we see how great this layers. It's perfect with sprays and even craft because the craft heavy stock is really good because it is resilient and robust to sprays because of its 130 pound thickness, it doesn't warp like a regular paper bag. And you can also use it on wood grain or crack leather, but we're gonna get into those textured ones more next week when we talk about uh, paints and other things. All right, so in addition to my papers, you know that I love a good tag. And I didn't talk too much last time about tags, but the Distress Tags, this is the same thickness and the same paper as the Mixed Media Heavy Stock. These are just heavy stock tags because I do love a number eight tag. I love to work on tags for, for demos and backgrounds, but I love that the mixed media is not as yellow as a regular manila tag. And of course the magic in that mixed media paper allows my ink to move a lot more than a manila tag. So if you've never tried these before, I'm not saying just go in and order, you know, hundreds of them, but give it a try and see if you like these uh, different than how you would work with manila. All right, so I'm gonna just start on a tag and we'll work with sprays. Now, caps, These are. this is one of those mediums that I honestly don't care about matching the caps because they're just uh, clear tops. Sometimes they 
Uh, there's batches that have like a smoky top. It doesn't matter, but I don't worry about like matchy matchy my tops, but you can uh, print and label the tops of these. Ranger has downloadable labels for these as well. I think it's a half inch circle punch and you can stick these on, but you'll need to find a really good glue that wants to stick to this uh, or a glue dot or something. So I, I just kind of have my sprays open. Now let's talk about when it comes to sprays on paper. We're going to talk about wet and dry. I think the best thing to do to show you this is going to be on watercolor. Because if I cover this, then as I go through my demos, I don't have to worry too much about explaining why I'm doing uh, the thing each time. Okay, so here we're going to just start with watercolor cardstock dry. When you go in with sprays on dry paper, beautiful, vibrant color. That's the thing about a spray, right? Imagine trying to get this intensity of picked raspberry from an ink pad. Think about that. How much ink are you going to have to push down directly from the pad on the surface? A lot. And so by doing that, you're going to burn through your ink pads very quickly. And I say burn through them, meaning not disposable, but you're going to need to re-ink them because you're pretty much juicing your ink pads to try to get the ink out. That's the benefit of a spray is that you're going to get intensity from a background. But when you go in with other colors, like this one is fossilized amber, and let's go in with a nice teal or blue. This is peacock feathers, okay? You can see obviously where they overlap, you immediately get the blend, right? And if you've only done ink pads, you know the power of the blend, right? The importance of when you mix pink and blue, you get beautiful purple. When you mix pink and yellow, you get orange and coral. When you mix yellow and blue, you get green, right? And of course, if you mix them all together, you're gonna get brown. But you can see immediately that because stains are translucent, you get a beautiful blend right away. But you also see where the color goes. Now, can you blend this out? Sure, we can add water to it. We can make movement with it because they are reactive, but it will always, and let me just grab some water just to show you. It's always going to maintain that space because that's where we initially sprayed. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're gonna get a beautiful movement, but we can kind of see where things have gone, where they've, where they've sprayed. And let's just dry this up. Okay, just to give it a, a quick little dry. Nice, now same thing. One of the things you have to really remember about sprays, and we talked about this a little bit when we were doing uh, inky backgrounds, is the side drip, right? Because it's fluid, you're definitely gonna get that side drip. So just remember that if you just tip your cardstock just onto that paper towel, which is why I like to work on something, you see how it just, it'll pull that right off the edge and then it will just fill in with color. So. That's another reason why I like to do that. I can just tilt that and we'll set that aside to dry. I'm just going to set it right over here. Now I'm going to go in with another sheet of watercolor cardstock. And this time I'm going to start with wet paper. So wet and dry. That one was dry. This one's going to be wet. And when I say wet, it's just going to be a few sprays with the spray bottle. We're going to go in with the same colors, but this time look what happened on contact. We get that incredible wicking because as we learned, Distress is water reactive. And when we say water reactive, it means it's designed to wick. Okay. And wicking is wonderful. But now our colors become very, very fluid and very blendy in a different way. You see, because of that wet paper, we're getting immediate striations of color throughout our background. And that's what I really like about using sprays on, on a wet background or a damp background, because I feel that the background is more organic than when I spray on dry paper. That's the big difference. And that's completely up to you. Whereas if you're, if you're working in a journal page or you're doing a card, just remember, if you just miss the paper, you don't have to hose it, you don't have to make it uh, drippy, but just getting some water down there, that's going to mean that the stain or the oxide, either one, is going to wick on contact. Because going into dry paper, that color has to absorb right away. And even though it will blend, we saw that it will still blend with water, the majority of that color got stuck into the paper right away. And as we add water, because these are not permanent, again, the same properties that we would have from our ink pads of just getting that excess bit of yellow. If I go in with water and I'll just drip some water on there, I'm going to get that same reactive. You see all those drips and drops. If I wanted to move this pink down, I can spray with water and I can get that color to move, right? Now it's just moving in a different way. It's not blending. It's that pink is kind of pushing that other color out. Do you see how, how that works from the wicking? And that is what makes it different than if you start with wet paper. 
because this just looks like, oh, wow, I'm a, I'm a watercolor expert. I was able to create the blended background. No right or wrong. There's never a right or wrong. It just depends on how you want those sprays to work. And I think it's important to understand that when you're working with your sprays. It's important to really get like, okay, do I want a blended look? Do I want something that's a little bit more intense? And the reason it's more intense is because, well, as I mentioned, more color is absorbed into that paper. Same color, same spray. It just depends on how this works. So I'm just going to dry these just a little bit. I'm not going to get them crispy dry, but I am just going to dry them up just so we can see the effects. And ultimately, as I mentioned, you can still get these to blend. They will always wick. They will always blend. But some people really want more of that wispy effect or maybe even want a much softer blend. And so I'll show you that also. Okay, so there we go. We have those two. Let's move these off to the side and I try to get this stuff out of the way. So I have a little landing spot. Okay, so ink, just mopping that up, just using a cloth, that's going to be fine. Now let's go into to working a little bit differently. Let's say we wanted our color to have, I'm gonna take this out of here. I'll take another one. Let's say I just wanna blend a single color, all right? Let's say I wanna take, uh, we'll do this one, blueprint sketch, beautiful, intense stain. We're gonna take a tag. So I know that I wanna create a nice blend or a nice gradation of color. Now, if I worked here, we already know what's going to happen, right? I'm gonna spray on this and I'm going to cover a lot of this surface with a colorant. So if I take the box and I stand it upright, there you go, I'm trying to, trying to work without blocking out too much of the, the light that's there and get it in camera frame. Okay, so you can see I've got that tall back wall that I can stand this up against. Okay, I'm gonna spray that with water and I'm just gonna take my stain and I'm gonna spray this along the top, okay? That's all I'm going to do. And then as I get this, this drippy, and you might like this drippy effect, you might say, hey, that's how I wanna edge it. I want it just to kind of look like that. But if I keep going in with some water, just along that bottom edge, I can get that color to just start wicking down. And don't be afraid of using your water. Use that water as a tool, manipulate that color. But this is a beautiful way to get an ombre effect on a card, right? Because we're using gravity to create that striation of color. Now you could go in these little edges that the ink didn't pull against. You can go in with your finger to pull that ink in there. You can go in with a brush just to get that color to move. But I love the fact that you can just dry this. Again, I'm gonna knock those drips off the bottom and have a beautiful blended background. Great for a card, really simple to just take one color, hit the top of that as long as the paper's wet, let it move down and miss that. Now, of course, if you didn't wanna spray with water, you could also just go in with a, a brush, a wet paintbrush, and just keep brushing this out and that will get it to blend as well. But the thing to remember about sprays, why are we using a spray? We use a spray because we want that spray effect, right? If you didn't want a spray effect, well then you should be using a paintbrush and watercolor. But the beauty of a spray is the spray. The, the fact that we're gonna get more of a striation of color, different elements on there, that to me is what I really like about understanding, choosing your mediums, totally up to you, choosing the art mediums that you wanna work with. If you're just an ink pad person, or if you like to work with a paintbrush or whatever that is, it's totally fine, all right? I'm just gonna go in and keep drying this because it's such a beautiful blend with just a spray along the top. But again, we're using that box from the top of this, right? Just a cool background. Again, I like that striation of color that has just more of a, I don't know, just a nice drippy look. But that again is from the spray. It's the fact that we have different uh, elements of drops. So we have some intense areas here, a little bit lighter there. Another great background, okay? Moving right along. So let's talk about mixing our colors, mixing the two together, because I do love mixing. So let's take this, we'll take a little bit more watercolor. This time I'm gonna work on the smooth side. Do you work on the smoother texture side? You know what, it's completely up to you as to how you want to work with it. There's, there's no right or wrong on this. Let's figure out some colors that I wanna work with. Now, when I use oxides, and I'll just keep them over here just for the sake of the demo so you guys can see, I'm gonna be opening up uh, more colors because I have to. Um, when I know I'm going to be working with oxides, I like to lay them down first because this is that fusion of dye and pigment. 
and you can really see it in a sprayable form. Let me get a darker color. There we go. You can see here, there, that's a perfect visual right there. See how the dye and the pigment has separated? Okay. Now these sprays have to be shaken up. Now I prefer to kind of just shake them like you're ringing a bell side to side to get that mixing ball going. Okay. The reason it's in a, a if this has nothing to do with bubbles or anything in the bottle, it's just the fact that if you have a spray bottle and you shake this up and down, you could risk pushing some of that liquid up the nozzle and it leak in the cap. Now, I'll be honest, there's a lot of times you'll see in the demos that I do that, but usually I'll just take a paper towel and I'll cover the little schnozzle, all right? I say schnozzle, so I'll just, like if I'm gonna do that, I'll just take this off and then I can just shake the snot out of it. Doesn't really matter, right? Because if you get any drippage, which this did, no, there's just a little bit, it's already captured in the paper towel, okay? So it's completely up to you. Some people just don't have the patience, well, that would be me when I say some people, to just shake it like this. But the other thing, the reason by laying it on the side is if you're laying it on the side when you're using this, it's going to take that pigment that's settled at the bottom and it's going to transfer it all along the, pretty much the length of the bottle. And this way, when you pick it up to shake it, it mixes up very, very quickly because you don't have to worry about busting up all of that pigment. I say busting it up like it's a solid, but it isn't. You get the idea. All right. So that's why when I'm working with it, I do lay it on the side. Again, a nice thing is you can have a piece of shelf liner here so the bottles don't roll everywhere <laughs> like that's going on. Um, or you can have different, different containers sitting around. You could have plastic containers, whatever works for you. But oxide sprays laying down just makes the mixing part a little quicker. But you do you, right? Some people might just want to uh, always have them uh, standing upright and kind of work with it. So we're going to just do some backgrounds. We're going to mix a little of the two together just to kind of go for it. All right. So on my watercolor paper, let me move this over here. Now you'll know why I always start here. I'm going to work just directly here on the mat just to show you some different ways that we can work with this color. So I'll spray this here, just a little bit of water. Um, we'll take some oxide. Right. And you can tell if it's mixed by looking at the bottom. And if you don't see any sludge, see how now that ink kind of pulled that area. If you don't have any sludge left, it's mixed. OK, so this will allow me to just to go in with some of that oxide. Now I can add some of our colors. Right. Because and it doesn't matter which one you start with. Right. You can you can build and work. You'll kind of figure out your own technique, your own look, what you like. You know, you might look and say, oh, hey, I really like it when I start with an oxide or a spray. The other thing about a spray, if you kind of restrict the actual spray nozzle, you can get it to spit color like I just did because I like those drips sometimes. Keep in mind that when you do that, you do build up a lot of color around the neck, which could go on your hands, but hey, you have to be kind of over that when you're working with sprays. All right, so the effect that I can get, I'm just gonna start dripping this around, is all about layering. All right, so this, because it is a spray, go with the flow, go with the movement, right? Don't be afraid to pick up your paper and move it around to get color to go where you want it to go. You don't have to always just stand there and stare at it while it's drying. If you want something to move, move it, right? Pick it up. If you want things to, to really drip, tap that down on the, on the surface to get that drippage to go down, okay? It's completely up to you. But what we need to keep in mind is we have this overspray and that's what's really cool. Now, remember last week with the ink pads, we talked about the significance of this uh, craft mat and the fact that it keeps the ink drops suspended or in its place. Same rules would apply on the spray. So if you wanted to do a background where you're just gonna be printing your paper into that ink, I would do my sprays on this craft mat. But for the sake of blending, it's totally fine to work on the glass. And yes, we can pick up this color from the glass. Right? We can we can still go in and we can pick some of that up. It doesn't want to lift much from the glass, but some of it will. And that's going to be just fine. I'm going to go in with some drips of water because I always think that's just going to break up my background. All right. So what's unique about this, and I'm just going to show you how impactful oxide sprays are with your inks. Oxide sprays are way more intense than an oxide pad in this form, okay? Because what's happened is, remember, I only started with a single color of oxide and I just did a little section of it, right? The other colors, the Blueprint Sketch and Twisted Citron, those were stained. That's the intense color you see, right? Look at my background. That bright green, 
stain, that deep blue stain, that kind of uh, turquoisey color, oxide, right? Because the stain is always going to be your intense color. But what an oxide spray does, because it is fluid, is it really likes to go in and kind of blend in with everything else. So now when you look at the background, we get that creamy, dreamy oxide effect over just about everything. It doesn't mean that it's going to overtake our color, but wherever those two mediums mix, it's going to oxidize over that layer and it's going to also oxidize that color. Even though we didn't use that color, right? We didn't use Twisted Citron as an oxide, but because we put down an oxide and we mixed everything wet, it still oxidizes that green, right? It still oxidizes that blue. But where, where those colors don't mix, we get the intensity of the stain, right? Pretty fun. So, so simple to work with it. I've seen some comments about uh, makers using it on jelly plate. Yes, you can spray these. Uh, you can use them so many different ways, but keep in mind that they will work on all the surfaces that distress inks and oxides work on. Meaning, is it just paper? No, it could be other things. It could be things like, it could be things like wood. It could be things like canvas, fabric, burlap. Okay. Now, none of these are permanent or washable because this medium is not a permanent washable medium, but it's great for creative projects, home decor, art projects, as long as it's not going to be uh, washed and dried, you don't have to worry about it. And on wood, it's really, really cool, right? Let me get my, let me get my splat box back. Isn't that a beautiful background? Really cool. And you could keep going, but the thing about sprays that you also have to remember is uh, keep in mind that it's fluid. So you don't have as much control as you do with an ink pad, right? You've got a lot of ink going on. So if you just keep going and going and going with color, your, your odds of making mud, well, they're pretty great. You can make some mud pretty fast. All right, but let's talk about just working on wood. This is an ideology vignette box. Let's say we just wanted to create like this cool pickling effect, maybe shabby chic. Maybe we want to go with a little cracked pistachio or maybe some evergreen bow. Oh, I kind of like evergreen bow. All right, so I'm just going to shake this up because they've been sitting on their side, they shake up really quick. Now, if you don't hear that mixing ball, chances are it might be stuck in that pigment at the bottom, okay? So if you're kind of trying to shake these up, you're like, oh, I don't have it, and you've laid it on its side, well, that mixing ball should have come, come clear by then. If not, again, probably cover it with a paper towel or uh, a towel and really shake that up just to kind of get it going. You wanna make sure that you're always mixing this up. Again, see how we can see that clear? That's how we know everything's mixed together. It's just really important. So on wood, on things like that, we can spray this, right? So I'll just spray the back this way. You guys can see that, okay? Now, first things first, you're going to see that it has that pigment coverage. Now you could dry it on there, but it's going to dry kind of, well, how you see it. See those like bubbles or clumps? It's gonna dry that way. So my advice, if you are going to use this on wood or something that doesn't want to immediately take uh, just the, the pigment part of oxide is going with a brush. You could use your finger. You could use a towel. You can use something and just work this into the wood. I, I normally like to go in with a paper towel because it's going to allow me to lift some of that color. So I'll use a little bit of both. Okay. And then once that's on there, because I want a, a pickling look, I'm going to spray it with a little bit of water because water is what's going to oxidize this. Okay. If you don't add water, it doesn't oxidize. And you can see right away, you see how like beautiful kind of minty that's getting, that little shabby. So if you just want color, oxide spray. If you want it to actually look a little, well, oxidized, you need to add some water. And we can let this air dry or we can heat dry it, but just for the sake of you seeing it, because once it dries on the wood, it does have a different effect, totally different. It's beautiful. Oh, Jasmine says she used the oxides on her wood advent. It's really cool on wood, it really is, because what you're gonna see in just a minute is the importance of the dye and the pigment in an oxide. Because you're like, well, hello, Captain Obvious. I would just take paint, water it down with a brush. I know how to pickle wood, yada, yada. Yeah, absolutely, you could. Um, but what's great about the oxide is take a look at the effect. See, that's one color. One color. But because it oxidized, the dye went into that wood, made it almost greenish. And the oxidize is almost bluish. And the more we add layers of water, the more we're going to get that oxidized effect on the wood. And the longer we let it sit there, same thing. So that's the other thing that's also really cool is that using an oxide, especially on things like wood, you're going to get that separation where the dye is going to soak into the substrate 
and the pigment is going to sit on top of the substrate and you kind of never know what you get. So you'll be able to create your own concoctions, if you will. Now, could you use spray stain and oxide? Yes, but you might miss out on the benefits of what those colors of dye and pigment do. So I would just play around with just straight oxide on things like wood or anything first. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Yeah, just a great effect. And it's it's just in the wood. Beautiful. And you could really just go for it. So any of those wood things that you see at the craft store, just those wood blanks or anything, just go for it. It's really a great way to, to incorporate it. And that's the thing to remember about spray. It's fluid. It's going to go in and it's going to give me kind of all the dance. But let's talk about other ways that we can create some fluid effects. Let's say you just wanted to go backgrounds. You were in background mode. And this is something that I learned from uh, Diane in journal. So if you're an art journaler, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this a bazillion times. You're like, yeah, okay, been there, done that. But it's cool to see. I think I'm going to work, I'll work on the smooth side again. All right. Actually, I think I'm going to go to mixed media. Let's do that instead. Instead of watercolor paper, I'm going to go to mixed media, heavy stock on this. Okay. This is just going to give me, I think, a little bit more flow. Uh, do you seal with anything? I'm not a big sealer, but if you were going to seal it, you would seal it with Distress Microglaze, right? Distress Microglaze would seal it the same way it sealed on paper last week, you would seal it on wood. Same thing. Uh, because it, again, if you painted a, a collage medium or anything over the top of it, it's going to re-wet that. Maybe okay, uh, but I prefer Microglaze so I can keep that oxidation, all right? So next we're going to work on background. So I'm just going to start with one piece here, but I have another piece set off to the side. And let me grab my sprayer again, starting with a little bit of water. This one, I'm going to use just a little bit of crackling campfire. That's really good. Here we're going to also throw in just a little bit. This is Kitsch Flamingo. And these are oxides. Remember, I kept oxides over here just for the sake of the demo. Here we've got uh, the stains. And then we're just going to add some other colors. So let's take looking for there we go a little fossilized amber because that's going to kind of punch that up just a little bit i'm going to take a little salty ocean over here and we'll kind of pinkify it over here with a little picked raspberry all right so we've got some colors down there now we could spray we can move we can do all sorts of things that we want we can leave it as is or we can just take another piece of paper we can, this could be wet or dry, it's totally on you, and just place that down over the top of this, make our print, right? So you can use your fingers, you can use whatever you want, right? You can use a brayer and I'll show you that in just a bit. And then we're just going to peel this apart just to reveal our backgrounds, right? It's a two for one kind of thing. Beautiful blended background, super simple. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. But if you just add those areas, you don't do a lot of blending on the paper. You let that wet paper do the blend. You can create quick backgrounds in an instant. So this is great if you like to do a lot of die cutting and you don't want to spend hours doing backgrounds knowing that you're going to cut them apart and you're just going to use parts and pieces. It's an easy way. But the beauty of this, let me just set this aside uh, for a second and get rid of this. I love cleaning this off of, off of the glass. That's why you'll see if I'm not using my splat box, most of the time I'm working on glass because if you do a lot of sprays over here on a craft mat or any other type of craft mat, those little, those little pits in the mat love to hold onto that ink and it seems like you're cleaning it forever. So that's really why I like that. So these backgrounds, well, same rules are going to apply. We can leave it smooth. So I'm just going to dry this one so you can see the, the creamy dreaminess of the smooth. All right. Just dry this out and I'll go back to what I uh, shared at the very uh, beginning in that that last tag. So remember right here, look at how the oxides kind of created that wonderful, I always say creamy dreamy, but that dreamy effect, even though a lot of these other colors were just the stains, right? That crackling campfire is everything, isn't it? But see, I love it in an oxide because it, it Crackling Campfire is an intense color, but in an oxide, it just, it adds such a wonderful sunset. So this is just, this is a dry background, but you can see that it's got that wonderful, not only creamy look, but it has the intensity because we're using both mediums, as I shared with you last week. So there is, rare, rarely do I just use oxide. I love using oxide with 
either an ink pad or a spray stain because I love the, the balance of color. Okay, so for this one, we're just going to play around with this background, meaning we're gonna dry it, but we're gonna also do the things that we do, meaning we can still splatter with some water, right? Just to create that effect. And so I'm just slowly squeezing the trigger of this just to get it to, to do my little splattering. Okay. You can let it sit there for a minute or we can take it off if we're going for something a little bit more dramatic. So we can take a towel, paper towel, something like that, lift that off if we wanna create kind of a, a beautiful galaxy looking background. But see, it's still going to be reactive with water even though we've sprayed it, even though we've dried it and we blended it. So you really have a lot of options when it comes to uh, working with your backgrounds. And how easy is that? Wet paper, spray, 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 wet paper, make a print. Now, if you didn't wet the paper, well, then you know from the very beginning of this demo that it's not going to flow as much. And maybe that's what you want. Again, you do you. Next. Now we'll talk about different ways that we can apply the colorant because sprays are sprays because you spray them, right? So if we're going to just spray that product, I'll get back my splat box. I'll flip that over because I'm not going to use that. So that's going to be fine. Let's take, let's take some stencils. Now for this, we can certainly spray through a stencil at any time, right? Create all sorts of different effects. But the other cool thing about uh, spraying with a stencil, is that if you have something that's going to have an all over pattern, you can also print from a stencil. So let me find something that's going to have uh, just an all over, well, this will work. I mean, we could use dots. You can, you can do whatever you want, but text is going to be a bit challenging because if you do, well, I'll use ringer because I do love this one. I love all those little grungy circles, right? Um, if you do text, you'll see on this that it's going to actually be reverse. So when I stencil, that's a little different for me. Um, I don't really start with wet paper because we've already seen what wet paper does, right? It's going to wick. And so if I'm stenciling something and I want the pattern to be there, I don't necessarily want that to start wicking underneath it. But maybe you do. Maybe you want your stencil design um, not as intense, right? Okay. So we're just going to set that down. I'm just going to make sure my layering stencil is kind of framed within the tags. Layering stencils were designed just for that, for layering. Um, they were never designed to do a giant background, although you can, right? You can work in parts and pieces to create backgrounds, but you want to make sure that you're, you're working with your stencils, I think, as elements of a background, not as focal points, because that's really their purpose is to create kind of different patterns. So there again, we're going to go in. Let's do something a little bit more intense. So we're going to take a little fired brick and I'm just going to just start spraying through there. And I'll start with this one. This one's just going to be uh, just color, just stain on this one. Ah, uh, yeah. Take a little Mermaid Lagoon. Mermaid Lagoon, super intense. All right. And I even think I'm going to go at the top up here because I want to pop that up just with a little picked raspberry. Now, Here's the thing about this particular stencil. I'm just going to pick it up. So it is all about the dismount. So you can see that I'm holding the stencil here and then I'm going to pick it up here because if you just try to pick it up, you could scooch it, right? We don't want to scooch it. So we're just going to pick this up. Normally I wouldn't let a stencil sit here so long and we've got ink on this stencil. That's fine. And we've got a juicy, juicy background, right? Because did you hear how many times I was like, psh, psh, psh. When I'm working with stain, this is usually what I don't do unless I want something super dark. But I still want to show you all the different kind of stages of using sprays with a stencil. And I'm, again, just sharing you the way I do it. You do you. So if I want to create a print, like you're like, oh, Tim, I'm going to do that print thing. Here's the thing to remember if I create a print. So let's say I'm just going to miss this off to the side and just see what happens when I get this printed effect. Because I use stain on dry paper as my base and wet paper as my top layer, you're going to see from a transfer, it's not good. You're going to push it out, right? So when we're working with a background and you might like this, you might say, Hey, I, I just still kind of like this. This is pretty cool. But the print, you're still going to squish out all of that color. And that's, what's important to understand about a stencil, right? So let me just show you the next thing. When we talk about squish, there is ink on the stencil. You saw that I kind of carefully set this aside. The ink that's sitting on a stencil 
is staying on a stencil. It's surface tension. It's not going anywhere. The cool thing about working with stencils is that you can use them to print with. You can create all sorts of, of cool effects when you're printing with it. But this color is super intense. We saw from that first one how intense it was because we put so much ink on it. So here's some things that I would suggest if you want to print with a stencil. And that is I'll take a tag. I'm going to mist the stencil with water, not my paper, the stencil, because I want, even though this is already fluid, there, just off to the side, I want to just make sure that this color is going to blend a little bit when I place it down. Now, because I mentioned surface tension, I can hold this until I get it exactly where I want to put this. And we don't have to always work in the splat box, but I just like to show you this is really how I work with it. So if I'm going to print on a tag, I'll normally start at the top. I love that little tab that has nothing that I can see you know, where I want to place it. And then I'm just going to position this, just start laying it down on my surface. You don't want to shift it once you, once you do that. And I'm going to press and print. Now you could do this with a brayer, but by using a paper towel, you see that squish? Remember what I showed you over here? That's why I wanted to give you that visual. The ink, because it is fluid, because it's not, it's not blended from an ink pad, that fluid ink is going to want to squish out. So if you just keep pressing something over it, you could have that color oozing into your background. Maybe that's what you want, right? So same thing, dismount, holding the stencil, taking the other thing, whoop, picking it up. And see, even when I dropped it, it dropped in the same place because, well, I was holding onto it. Perfect example, not, didn't intend on that, but perfect example. So here's my print with a stencil. Take a look at that. That's really cool because again, fluid. We have those drops, those drips of that intense color. And see, by spraying that stencil with a little water, I got that wonderful blend. Okay, let's take this a step further. We can take our tag now. Let's set this off to the side. We're going to, we'll do some other uh, stencil prints just so you can see. So now I want to just dry this, right? I want this ink to dry because I love the intensity. But here's another great thing. Maybe you don't want those drips and drops, but you love the intense color. Once this is dry, it's no longer fluid, but it is always reactive. So now I can take heat tool in hand, water in hand, and I can react this tag. So I'm just gonna start spraying this, and that's gonna get those colors to just start wicking. See how it's wicking? Ah, that's the joy of a spray versus a re-inker. We always get that reactive property indefinitely of this medium. And so here I was able to get what I felt was a very crispy background to be a bit more fluid and organic. And I'm just drawing it to control the wisp. I'll go back into this red area just to get those to move, dry it. So you get to control the, the wispy effect, if you will. If you just kept going and adding water, it's going to keep wicking out. But this is great for a background pattern because then the background pattern really becomes, when I say un unidentifiable, it's when you can't identify it, you don't know that it was done with a stamp or a stencil. You're like, wow, how did you get those rings in there? That wispy color. And again, you do you. So any stage that I share in a background, you could stop at any of those, okay? That's really what that is. You can totally uh, decide, hey, I like that crispy print. Hey, I actually like printing with a, a stencil because now I'm getting uh, more color. You can do any of these things. This is what a demo is all about, is just to share ideas and give you a little bit of inspiration as to how to work with different things. Let's talk about just spraying through a stencil. We're gonna do this one. We'll do a background. We'll do this mixed media, okay? And I'm going to work on a stencil and just talk about, and I'll, I'll just work on the glass. I'll, I'll clean it up, but I think it's gonna give you a better visual uh, when you come to work with it. So let's talk about a couple of things we can do. First off, I want to dry this. Okay. Now, if you want to put a stencil, let's just say on a card right there, right? Obviously my stencil is smaller than my card and it's going to give me this edge. And if I spray, we're going to get this edge. <laughs> that's, that's just what you're going to get. But here's some ways that we can kind of uh, maneuver that, if you will. Now, if I'm going to work and I know I have something specific in mind, maybe it's going to be, for example, a card or a tag, and I don't want things to move around. There's other tools that we can work with. I've talked about using uh, Sticky Grid from Sizzix. It's just that adhesive-backed gridded sheet, so you peel this off, 
it's a repositionable low tack. You peel this off, repositionable low tack. And as long as your glass mat is clean, doesn't have any ink or anything on it, we can just stick this down. Oh, see, it's not clean. <laughs> Let me clean it with water. Because if it has distress residue on it, distress has resin in it and nothing will stick to it. So if you've ever tried to like do some ink blended backgrounds and then you go to put a sticker on something and you're like, this sticker is not sticking. My distress ink is dry. Your distress has resin in it. So unless you heat set it, it will forever be that. So let's see if I either ruin this piece of sticky grid or it's going to stick. Oh, there we go. Now it's going to stick. Okay. So we'll put our piece of paper down and I'm just putting it at an angle just because I think that's a cool perspective in the camera lens. No no other reason. Okay, I'll place the stencil down. I'm a huge fan of masking tape. You can also use washi tape, but whatever you want to work with. I'm just going to take some tape and I'm going to position this and place it down. Now, the reason I like this is I always, if I'm doing a specific background, I love the hinge effect that I can see what I'm doing, go back and do more if I choose, especially like with a spray. If I spray it and I'm like, oh, I want to change it. I just, that's how I like to work with stencils. But now we've got this edge, this weird edge. Now you can do a lot of things. Um, you can go in, usually I would just go in with another piece of cardstock, another piece of paper and mask that off. Or I'll just take a piece of scrap paper. You can take a paper towel, right? You can clean that edge or you can just go in. This is what I like to also do. I'm just going to kind of give that a torn edge. And I also like to just take that into a stencil so you can edit that as well. So think about that when you're working, even with uh, this one just has words, but let's say you were doing an all over pattern, right? You might want to create this effect on a card and now you don't have that, that straight edge from a tag. So if you have, even if you don't have these stencils, if you have smaller stencils that you want to use on a journal page, think about that using paper towels or torn paper as a mask, you can create much more of an organic look on your background. Okay, so let's go in, let's do a little bit of, we're gonna grunge this up a bit. This is gonna be ice spruce oxide. So this already is going to give me a blue kind of uh, very smoky effect. See, I already got a drippage because I didn't cover it and I'm good with that, all right? So here I'm just gonna go in and I'm just gonna miss that, okay? So unlike the other one where I was just hosing it down over here, that's the other thing about sprays you'll learn control. You'll learn how to control the color to your liking. It's going to be a little speckled egg on there. Let's go in with a little bit of rusty hinge. And so this time you can see I'm definitely keeping my distance. I'm not super close. I'm just staying a little further back because then I can get just those drips in that different kind of spray pattern. The other fun thing about a spray, it's a spray. It's a spray. And because it's a spray, we want to play with the spray, the pattern, the, the speckly fleckly look right? That's what we want. And now we can go in again, pick this up. It's already held at the top. Look at that background. Now let me just pick this up because it's already on my sticky grid. That's going to be there. Look at that, right? Shut up. See, look at all those little specks, those little drips. We were able to get this effect because we didn't just juice it with sprays. We were doing very, very light looks, but see that organic edge? Another cool thing, because now we can go in with another stencil, we can do ink blending, we could do stamping, we could do journaling, you could do whatever you want. And now we've got that speckled look because of how the sprays were applied. But more importantly, do you see, I'm trying to, I'm holding the stencil up with one hand and I'm holding this, but do you see how that rusty hinge is sitting on top? You know why? Anyone? Anyone? Well done class. The reason is, is because I started with oxide, right? Oxide was my first color down. That was that ice spruce. So that created that pigment layer, that base, that gray base. And now my rusty hinge, there we go, is sitting on the top. If they were all stains, those colors, as soon as you put those down, would blend together. They wouldn't stay speckly because they're fluid and they would just move into with one another. Uh, same with if you just use oxide. So that's another benefit of mixing oxide spray and spray stain is you get this cool speckly look. Now, ultimately I would have dried it immediately because you can see how it's starting to wick out, right? The longer it's on paper, the more it moves. So when I was done with that, I would have taken it out. I wouldn't have talked to myself this long and I would have just gone in and dried it just to create that effect. You can do ink blending over this now. You could have done this over an ink blended surface. 
So when you're stenciling, you don't always have to think about uh, working with this as a surface, right? So now let's talk about this. Could you print with this? Yes. But the reason I was holding this is just to prove uh, a, a very important reminding point that I do. Some people don't even care about this, but if you're working with a stencil like this and you go to print, everything is going to be backwards. Now that doesn't mean you can't print with stencils that have writing. It just means that if you know you're going to print with it, then just place it down on a surface, spray ink on the back of it, and then print with it, right? But it, I find it really challenging to, to kind of do a twofer like I did here, the two for one where you're doing the background and you're printing, unless you don't care that your text is backwards. And honestly, there's many people that just don't care because it adds to the art ambiance of everything. And I would agree. I really would. All right. Because you know I'm going to print this right now. Okay. I've got paper over here. That's the other thing, man. You're you're going to have tags aplenty. You're going to have tags or cardstock or or whatever you want with this. And for this one, here, let me just set this off to the side. Okay. My sticky grid, I'm just going to pull this off and stick it somewhere for now because I can reuse sticky grid. You can reuse sticky grid until it's no longer sticky. Then it's just grid. And then you probably don't want that. So so for this, because I know the kind of colors that I have in the background, I'm just going to make a quick tag with this. And every time you use an oxide spray, you want to do that. I'm going to add a little bit of that color. Let's take, we'll still take a little speckled egg on this one. We're going to add a little water and I'm just going to take my spray and now I'm just going to drag through it just to create a different effect. There we go. I like that look of that. Let me clean this up. See, so nice to take it off the glass and we'll dry this. Cool. Okay. Nice. Well, thanks, Autumn. It should make you comfortable. Really, thinking is overrated. Honestly, it is. I think, you know, the worst part of uh, being a maker, honestly, is just is being inside your head. That's the worst part because that's the part where it doesn't make making fun. That's just what it is. Could you lay the tag on top and print it that way? You could. Absolutely. You can print. But the reason I like to print from the stencil is because I can see through the stencil and I know that I'm, I'm able to to kind of get that ink to squish out. So there again, I've got ink sitting here. I'm spraying that with water, right? So my tag is now dry, got a background spraying with water. And now I'm just going to flip this over and I'll place that down, get those kind of numbers on there. There we go. That's going to work. Take paper towels. So see, this is what's going to allow me to kind of go in and push that. So if you do it the other way, well, unless you have a paper towel under there, uh, you're going to get a little bit of the ooze, but see how I can see that ink move. I don't know if the camera's close enough, but yeah, there's ink under there and you do have to make a print. You've got to press that off of the stencil to get that to make transfer. And it's still going to stay. A lot of it's going to stay on the stencil. And the longer you hold it there, the more it's going to print into the paper. So again, hold your stencil, dismount, flip. But look at that. Yeah. See, I don't care that it's backwards. Right? That's the other thing. It's just a, it becomes a cool background. And once you start playing with sprays, man, just that's it. Sky's the limit. You just keep going. And when you say, who, what if you should just be doing it? You're like, okay, that's what if, right? Because now I've got this layer. I can take this. I've got this drying. And now I can go into something a little grungy, right? We can take that. It's a little hickory smoke spray stain and I'm just going to do the splatter and you can do the splatter uh, with the spray or the splatter brush, but I'm just going to hold the neck of the bottle. I've got my, got my distance out here and I'm just going to splatter. There you go. Just with a little bit of that color, dry it just a little bit and then go in with a paper towel and just dab those off, right? Cause less is more. Let's see, look at that. Just a cool background, just a little splatters. So you can really have a lot of fun with, with your sprays. All right, moving on. What if we want to create something? And by the way, for cleaning your stencils, just so you know, when I clean stencils, um, I have a container of water off to the side. Uh, for those of you that watch my demo, you clearly know the inside joke of the lasagna pan. 
I'm not sure what ever came in here, but I know it wasn't lasagna because Mario <laughs> makes his own. But it's just a pan that he gets. It's a plastic tray, but that's where my stencils go, right? So it's always off camera. It's just cold water. I don't care. You could have warm water. You could have, but it's not sudsy or soapy. It's just water. And see how that color just floats right off of your, your stencil. So you just, that's, that's how I clean it. And the reason I clean my stencils that way is because I kind of feel like I'm just putting them in the bath. And then when they come out of the bath, all I have to do is dry them off. Because when you come out of the bath, you don't scrub yourself, right? You just dry off. So that's the thing to remember about a stencil. If you can kind of get in the habit of just having a container of water and let the water do the trick, whether it's glue or texture paste or anything, that water will still dissolve all those mediums without you scrubbing. Because if you do this to a stencil, you really have a chance of ruining your stencil. If you've, if you've done it, you know what I mean. Meaning like once you bend it, it's a bit of a challenge to try to ever get that stencil to lay flat again. And I know some people go, Oh, you heat it, you put it in the oven, you do it. It's a piece of plastic. You don't, you just take care of it. That's all. Okay. So if you didn't want to create that spray effect, there are ways that we can apply stain because they're fluid um, with different things. And we can create some pretty cool kind of funky effects. So here I'm going to use the craft mat now because I want to use uh, this to hold my stain in place. Remember, this is the removable mat that is on your media mat. If you do a lot of fluid stuff, you wanna remember when you're cleaning it, don't clean into it, cause you're gonna get the edges to curl. Um, I, the top corner of mine is starting to curl. If it does start to curl, you can try to curl it the other way. Some people have tried to iron it, I'm not sure. Um, but really, that hopefully that doesn't bother you too much, but you can clean the surface, put it under a book and it should flatten out a little bit more. But ultimately, you can't keep pushing medium into the fray here because that's what's going to get it to eventually not cling uh, to the mat, right? But I use this, it's a tool. It's like Mario always says, it's like a cutting board, right? When you have a cutting board, you're gonna get knife marks in there because you're cutting on it. Well, same thing here. This is eventually gonna get uh, mucky because you just, you use it like that, all right? Mario, you have the same cutting board you've had when you started cooking? Nah, oh yeah, sure you do. <laughs> nice, you bait me like that and that's it. Okay, so here's some different ways that we could apply color to a surface. I'm just going to take some paper. We're going to just do a little bit of, this is still watercolor paper, mixed media. Um, I'll do a little bit of white in a minute. Okay. So one way that we can do it is we can take some colors. Let's get some brown, right? Why not do this? This is a great way to incorporate uh, grunge or brown. And I'm going to take some colors and I'm just going to spray it right here onto the mat. Uh, do a little evergreen bow. So these, again, you can just shake them side to side. I'm going to lay these down so they're ready to go. <laughs> there we go. And I'm going to put this just in another spot. Th again, think of this as a palette. That's really what we're, what we're creating over here is a palette. And I'll do a little bit over here of some Mermaid Lagoon. Okay, that's a, that's a good start just to show you. So what I can do here is because I want these inks to, to move, and I'll show you kind of two different ways is we can take, oh, where did it go? Oh, it's somewhere, here they are, they're buried. All right, we're going to take a palette knife, right? I like to take a, a flat palette knife. This is just, this is one of the Distress palette knives. Uh, it doesn't make it any fancy other than the fact that they're really nice. They got a little bounce, they are plastic. I like something that's got a little bit of a bounce, but also some rigidity, right? Cause you don't want it too flimsy. Uh, and it also comes with my other favorite, when you'll see when we do texture paste, it's like a little sports car. Right, so two different shapes. This one very flat, this one a little pointy, okay? And I like this because what I'm going to do is I can take my palette knife and I can actually just pick up some of this stain with a palette knife, right? Now, if you go on to dry paper though, here's what you need to know, right? So by applying that color, we're just gonna get little lines. So if you're gonna do the palette knife thing, I prefer to work on wet paper. So let me get, let me get a little bit more color down. Okay, I just flipped that piece of paper over just so you can see. We're gonna spray that with a little bit of water. I'm just gonna pick up some color with a palette knife and I'm just putting it on the edge of that. So I don't know if you can see the drips, but I'm just picking it up like that, place it down and you're just gonna kind of skip it across, right? And the cool thing about just doing this is you're just getting an, an interesting way of applying color. You can create striations, you can create streaks, we can pick up other colors and it just it's a cool way to make a, a streaky background, right? We can flip our paper the other way. Some people can create more of a, a wood grain. Some people can create like a serious grunge, 
right? If you put just a little on the edge, let's go into this watercolor paper. There we go. Pick this up and just go from the edge and just create like a quick scrape. Then you can go in and just really manipulate that area. And this is creating, again, streaks or striations of color. When would you use this? I don't really know. Maybe if you were going for like a faux wood grain or you wanted something that's just going to have a much more of a streaked linear pattern, it's just a way that you can apply color. Very simple to do, um, very unpredictable, but it also, again, applies color in a way that's different than a spray or an ink pad would do. And that's what you have to remember about your art mediums. There's gonna be times that you're gonna say, oh gosh, I remember that. You know, I wanna go in and, and, and apply this color. Could you spray this? Sure, could you get this really, really wet? Yeah, watch what happens when you get it and you can see how, how juicy it is. But that's just gonna make it flow even more when you put it on the paper. So you might just go in and just do this just to create a quick watercolor background. There's many different ways that we can do it. This is kind of my go-to is mixed media paper because as you can see, it takes the color different. It allows more playtime where watercolor paper just wants to grab onto the medium. So when we start talking about surfaces uh, last week, surfaces really are important for certain te techniques like this because you, I prefer that my color is going to skip across the surface. Again, we'll go on this side, we'll pick this up. And that's why I don't really prefer to, to have this too wet Right, just like to pick that up and just create those streaks of color. It's just fun. So just a cool way that we can apply color to a surface. All right. See, I like that. That's what I would do. And then it's like, oh, did you dry brush it? Did you? Yeah, it's just a palette knife. But see, unpredictable. You're getting little spots. You're getting nice blends. That's just one way to do it. And yeah, it could easily be a landscape. You could stamp mountains, you could just do all sorts of different things, right? But here's another way that we can create uh, different effects, and that is with a brayer. So let me clean this up. <laughs> so again, when I'm cleaning up, I'm starting on the mat, going over, off the mat, okay? Starting on the mat, go across, off the mat. So if I'm wiping any, any medium like this, I'm always wiping away from the mat, so I'm not pushing anything under the mat. That helps keep your mat flat as long as possible. Yeah, I re this reminds me, remember that time we were demoing with Diane at Carson, uh, Diane Reevely from Dilutions, and it was her first time kind of playing around with a media mat, I gave her one at the show to work with, and she came over like after the first hour and her mat was like a fruit roll up. It was just rolled up onto the thing. I'm like, you, you just got that. Uh, and th so then I gave her a replacement mat. She came back like a couple hours later, she's like, this actually started an hour ago, but, and she has tape on it. And it's like, because she was just spraying and then just, you know, wiping the whole surface as one instead of treating this separate than the glass. And ultimately, if you don't have a use for this, if your technique is not using this, then peel it off if you want an, a larger glass area to work with. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about brayering, which is really cool. I'm gonna go in and do some peeled paint oxide for this because I really, really like it. All right. Just gonna take my spray here, I'm gonna spray this down. Now here's another thing, let's say we have some, some peeled paint, but we want that color to be, I don't know, a little different, a little bit more uh, intense. Can you add a color to a color? Sure, we can, we can alter a color together if we want, right? This isn't gonna do much to it, but it's just a little speckled egg into that peeled paint oxide. Probably gonna change up that color somewhat. But now we're going to get into a brayer. So these are distressed brayers, it's a rubber brayer. I have a YouTube specifically on uh, the brayers and the difference of this brayer and other brayers, but why I like this particular material, this rubber. Now, when you are picking up color, now this comes in two different sizes. It comes in a little sports car, a little mini, and a regulation one. Both of them have these little feet, these little rubber tipped feet. And that is so when you're not using it, your brayer always sits down on a surface so the roller is not touching it flat. You never wanna store a brayer on a flat surface or you'll get a flat area in your brayer. You can also just hang it up. But my favorite thing, of course, is cleaning. I can just take my thumb, push this out. So these handles are designed to bend, right? So you just push this out, take out the roller, clean it off, and then you could easily put this back in. So that's why I like this design. I will say that if you're heavy-handed, if you're a heavy-handed brayer and you do this and you push down really hard, you're gonna get these to separate, which just means you're pushing down way too hard. So when we go to ink this up with a spray, 
I'm going to lightly roll through it, okay? So by rolling through, do you see, see how that color is coating on the brayer? It's sticking on there in a, a very fluid form. Now watch the mat. If I take the same fluid, but instead of rolling through light, I push down, and you could tell, because look at how my finger's changing color, and I push down to pick up the color, the color is not on the roller. The color just lines up right there because you pushed it all off. Right? And all you're gonna get is a line. So when you're gonna do that, you get a line. It's important when you're trying to put medium on a brayer, especially something fluid, just roll through it really, really light. And that's what's going to get it to coat on that surface. So if you ever wanted to take medium off, well, that's pressing, because that's what we do on our surface, right? And it's interesting because a lot of people kind of don't realize when you're brayering a surface, you're applying pressure because we're trying to get the medium off. But if you want to coat the brayer, we want to just roll through this, all right? So let me just, I'm gonna clean this up now that I made a hot mess because I don't, I don't like that, the splotchiness, because that's not how I apply uh, spray to my brayer. Okay, there's my little towel. Okay, let's go back and do those colors again. See when you show what not to do? There we go, we'll still throw in that color. I liked what that speckled egg did. It, it made peeled paint just a, a little punchier. All right, so I'm just gonna go in. I'm just gonna roll through this. Now this is gonna be dry paper and we're just gonna get just a really cool uh, striation of color. I like this a lot because it just really has kind of a fresco look and we can go in with different colors, right? If I want to clean this up, super simple to clean, we can take a paper towel or a baby wipe. I have some baby wipes here. There we go, I'll grab that. I'm going through paper towels like crazy. Okay, so here's how I like to clean the brayer. I'm just gonna grab the brayer, right? I'm just going to take this right off of the handle. Easy to just completely wipe it off and it's clean that quick, right? And then pop it right back in the handle. That's my favorite thing about working with these brayers. And I use these brayers for glue, for paint. Uh, there's people that have just, yeah, they've used it with gel plate. They've just used it for a lot of things and I'm happy to say that they like them. <laughs> that was important to me as well that people people found the same love of this. Now, is it the best brayer in the world? No, I'm sure there's people that are gonna say this is a way better brayer. This is a brayer though, in my opinion, it's perfect for distress mediums, ink pads, oxides, sprays, collage medium, all sorts of things. That's what I really love about this brayer. So let's do something a little grungier. So here I'm just gonna take a little ground espresso spray. We're gonna take the mystical frayed burlap spray. Okay, and I say that because it, it has some really crazy properties to it. All right, so we've got that and we will take a tag. Okay, now this time I'm gonna spray the tag just with a, a little shot of water. I'm gonna take my brayer, just pick up some of this and see how it just can roll freely around that. That's what we want. We wanna keep, we wanna keep that kind of drippy pattern the best we can. And then we're just gonna start going over our tag. All right. Okay, then I'll spray this with water. So what's great about applying stains with a brayer, as you can see, is that when you do this, you're getting really intense streaks of color that you wouldn't get if you were just spraying, okay? How is it different than a palette knife? Well, a palette knife is very skippy, unpredictable, and you can see that a palette knife is usually pretty much uh, more linear where when you get the brayer it's a bit more organic because now we're dealing with drips and how those drips actually start out the width of them and how they taper off at the end okay so i'm just going to keep adding water to this background we're even going to stand this up because see how i can get that ink to move all right Cool. See, I love those drips. See the drips that I'm going for? That's what I'm doing. And you can just hold that up and we can get those drips to go back the other way. And if I want to remove them, just edit. There we go. So this is what, this is kind of the look that I was hoping to achieve. So I'm happy I was able to do that on camera. Not everything always works out, but this is what I love. I love the undertones 
of that ground espresso, that really dark, and then you can see that frayed burlap. A lot of people talk about it being uh, a very magical oxide. It does some really, really cool things. So that's the benefit of doing stain with a brayer. You know, I think that's getting that pattern with a spray. It's super simple. You can still blend it, as you can see, or you can just let it dry and you get this really cool fresco look. I would say that if I had a choice of which way do I prefer to apply stains, a palette knife or a brayer, it would be a brayer because I like the more uh, kind of tapered look than linear, but hey, that this could still be a very cool effect for certain things. All right, so moving along, let me just clean this up real quick, super simple. I always just, it's the easiest way to clean glue or honestly anything off of these guys. Okay, put that back in, there we are. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Okay, let me set this aside. I've got a baby wipe over here. We're going to get into some some texture, okay? Because this is where the sprays really go to town. Just going to take some water on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. Push away from the edge. See how I clean all that sludge away from my mat? And now I can just clean this off the glass. Super simple. There we are. Okay. So let's say we wanted to create some texture and there's texture, there's a lot of different ways that we can create texture. First thing of course is an embossing folder, right? If you have embossing folders, it's a great way that we can introduce texture to a paper. An embossing folder, especially a 3D folder is going to break through the fibers of the paper. And when you break through fibers of the paper, um, your sprays will react with this paper differently. Okay, meaning because we've broken through, our colors are going to saturate the paper uh, where it's broken much deeper than when the paper still has a coating on it. Okay, and you can't visibly see that. You'll just see it when you add your sprays to it. Okay, so let's just do that. So this one happens to be mixed media. This is engraved, one of my favorites. I love just the, the pattern of this. And remember when it comes to folders, you can use the any or the Audi. So obviously if you use the, the other side, we're gonna get more color into that channel right, that debossed area. And when you have it here, we're going to get it into that debossed area because now we're gonna, we're gonna do a fluid medium. So that's going to pull up or sit in areas differently. So let's take this, let's get our splat box back so we don't have to <laughs> keep mopping up pools of stain. And we're going to work with this. I do love the 3D folders, especially when it comes to fluid. Now, there's a lot of ways to do this, yeah, we. We've done ink blending, we can do all sorts of things, but I love working uh, specifically with color. This one I'm gonna go uh, definitely a little grungier. And we're going to add some metallic to this one. So here's another cool spray that's in the Distress line. These are called mica sprays, right? They come in a three pack. This is how they're sold, that's it. Now, Ranger has different sets of these for different designers. Diane has a set, Dina has a set of their own colors. And all these are, this is a colored mica in a clear liquid. Okay. And that liquid is resin. And what that does is that allows us to bond to the surface. So you can spray this on chipboard and wood and fabric and ribbon and paper flowers and cardstock. And that mica is bond to the surface. What the other thing that's cool about mica sprays is this liquid is not water. So unlike spraying water and mica on there to get the inks to react, these do not react the inks over the top. They just add a mica sheen. Because the mica is in a clear liquid, these don't offer color in a sense like it's not going to be opaque. It's not going to be like a metallic spray. Well, let's do that demo real quick before we go into that. We'll compare a, a metallic spray stain to a mica spray, all right? So both of these have pigment. This one is just mica and resin. This is actually a metallic pigment. So two completely different beasts for that. This little guy, I shake them both the same way. So we're just gonna mix these up. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah, and you'll know, like, really, if you use a splat box, it's really important. Mario, would you do me a favor? And in, in that top drawer, the big drawer, grab a piece of black cardstock. It's filed under black cardstock. Thanks. All right, just so you can see, really, the, the difference in working with it, okay? Because we can work on white cardstock or black cardstock, but obviously when you do with metallics or mica, you're going to see the darker the surface, the more you're gonna see it, so thanks. All right, let Tim know to clean the glass mat from glue, don't use a razor. No, 
Don't don't use a razor or or goo gone, Don. My advice to clean glue off of your glass mat is hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer will dissolve dried glue, collage medium, dried paint, dried anything off of glass. Hand sanitizer, and it doesn't have you know a like an oil or anything like goo gone would. So just use hand sanitizer, put it on, it will take it off. You do not need to use a razor blade on this at all. Hand sanitizer, same thing here. If you get something on here, which I can't imagine anything that would stick to this mat, but on the glass, hand sanitizer is your jam, really. A goo gone would work, there's no doubt, but really hand sanitizer is just, it's more affordable and I think it's just, it's very user friendly because it dissolves it almost on contact. So hopefully that helps. But yes, avoid a blade on the glass. Uh, and the reason is like when the media mat first came out, we talked about that it could be a cutting mat and it can be, but not all blades in the craft market are the same. And if it's, if your blade is made of surgical steel and usually they don't mark which ones are and which ones aren't, surgical steel will leave a mark in your glass mat. So now we just, we say like, if you're going to cut, just use a cutting mat. Otherwise, well, you could risk leaving a, a scratch in your mat. So, because not all blades are, are created equal. All right. So here we go. We've got a mica spray and we've got a metallic spray. This is antique bronze. So I'm just going to spray this. Let's get this going first. There we go. Okay. So remember when I talked about opacity, see, this is almost like a metallic spray paint. It's beautiful and it is very, very metallic. It is also water reactive. So if I have uh, let's take a background. Gosh, we'll just take one of these. We'll take one of these sludgy ones that we did just to show you. So if I spray this and I use this metallic, again, we're talking about a metallic spray stand and I spray this on. Okay. You can see that it goes on opaque. Do you see what I was talking about? How it covers what you sprayed it on. Can you get it to move? Yes, but you're still moving an opaque medium, right? So it's, it really does cover up what you're using. So when I use metallic, I use it very sparingly and I use it when I want metallic. Okay. That's the thing because it's going to dry with a really intense, you can still see through it when we added some water, but it's a very intense metallic. Do I use them much? Honestly, I do not. I don't use them much, but that's just, a, again, a personal preference, a, a maker preference. But if I wanted something that was just like a metallic paper, I'd probably just use it and, and create that effect. But here's what's great about mica sprays, right? These are my jam. I can take a mica spray I'm going to shake it up and we want to shake it up till we have no sludge at the bottom. See how it's now clear versus the pigment, right? That mica, we want it to be clear. So you always want to shake these, these guys up and we're going to miss this. Now here's the beauty of this. When you first put it on, you're like, oh my gosh, it's going to be opaque. Nope. When this dries, that mica is all that's going to be left behind. So let's just dry both of these on the paper. and just show you the difference. Okay. Now is the mica reactive with water? While it's wet, yes, you can get it to move, okay? But when it's dry, it doesn't really like to go anywhere. So here's what we've got. So now you can see these little dots right here. They really are shimmery and sparkly. Oh my gosh, they're so good, but they're smoothie. But then here, it's just opaque. And this is still wet, but just opaque. So if I'm working on a background, okay, I have a tendency to work with a mica spray. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use a mica spray. Maybe I'll even try a uh, little brass and we'll do it on that embossed paper that I was telling you about. Okay. But while I'm at it, while I'm talking about different sprays, if you have an issue with your sprayers ever, a um, couple of things is anytime I use something that's like a different medium, like a mic mica spray, I just wipe off when I'm done. At the end of this demo, I will go in with a baby wipe and I'll wipe just the tips off of anything that has pigment. I don't do this with my stains, but I do it with my oxide sprays or anything. Um, I just wipe it off. That's just preference. Uh, if your sprayers ever clog, you can try soaking them in warm water and spray them underwater. If you have things like resist spray, then this is something that you're going to want to remove and actually spray when you're done using it, spray to flush water through the sprayer and then replace it. But if things go wrong, you can just get replacement sprayers. Now these sprayers fit uh, Rangers spray bottles, any of the spray bottles, my, you know, mine, dilutions, I believe they fit gloss sprays as well, but they're just sold in a, in a pack and you can replace that. And I think that's going to eliminate the, the frustration you might have. Okay. So let's talk about this background. We're going to go into something that's a bit more kind of patina ish. So let's take, 
we're going to take some rusty hinge and we're going to add that. Now this is dry. We're working on dry paper right now. We're going to take a little peacock feathers. We'll even go in with a little bit of salty ocean just to add some of that. And you see it, that, that little spit at the end. I do that a lot where I like to just, you know, try to get just a little splatter here and there. And I'm going to go in with a little bit more peacock because I thought that was very cool. And I'll pop this off with a little fossilized amber. All right. So this one, you can see I really juiced it up, All right? That's what we want. We want that color to sit in to those areas on embossed paper. That's what we're going for. And you'll see that the color we can keep adding. That's the other beauty of this. Just kind of look and see what it is that we're working on. So now we're going to take some mica spray. I'm going to shake this one up. I love the metallics. Okay. Sheldon, it is a lifesaver with resist spray, but really on the resist, if you just get in a habit when you're done with resist, unscrew this, take it in the sink, run the water, put the tube in the drain and just spray until it flushes clean, then put it back and you're good to go. All right. So we're going to shake this up. No sludge. There we go. Okay. So we're ready to go. That's another thing about the splat box. A lot of times I can kind of practice in the back. Oh, perfect. Look, I mean, I say perfect, but not ideal, but see, this one's not working. Okay. No worries. I'll clean it later, but I have a replacement sprayer that I can just go to town with. See, gosh, it's as if it knew, right, Mario? It's as if it. I did. I clogged that one for you just on purpose. Did you? Yeah. You're the best. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> That's just what it is. Okay. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to add a little, little bit of mica to start with. Okay. So now that we have this, we're going to dry it. And we're going to add a little bit of water to this. Here's another little tip about the, the sprayer. If you guys have one, if you have a distressed sprayer and you use it or you don't use it, um, you know, when you're spraying, usually we're pointing down to the surface, right? And when we're pointing down to the surface, what happens to our liquid? Our liquid goes from here to here. You see that? So even though the bottle is uh, just over half full, when I tip it, it goes down. If that little tube, that little, can you guys see it? There you go. That little tube in there. If that tube is pointing to the back, then every time you use it, it's, it's not going to spray. It's going to be like, it's, it's spitting, it's missing. So you can go in and adjust the tube. you take this out, you grab the tube and you just twist this. So see if I'm holding onto the tube, right? And the tube is this way. If my sprayer is pointed the opposite way, see, that's no good. We don't want that. We don't want that little fishtail. What we want is we'll hold the, and I'm holding just that base right there. I'll spin this around. So my sprayer and my tube are pointing in the same direction. And then when you put this on the bottle, all you're doing is you're just turning the neck. This little neck piece is what turns on the sprayer. Also remember your distress sprayer has a lock, a little switch. So if it's locked, it's not going to spray. It's going to click. And if you keep doing it, you'll break it. And that's, that's it. You'll need to push it to where it's unlocked. I leave mine unlocked all the time, unless I'm traveling, it goes in a bag. But see now that little tube is pointing forward. So every time I tip forward, it's in the deepest end of the liquid. There we go. That's an important one. Okay. There we have it. We're going to just dry this up. Mmm. Love that little splatter. So see that little splatter of ground espresso? Mmm. So, so good. And this is what's really cool about this piece of paper by just adding all that color. You can see that the dye really permeates those areas where it's broken. So see how you can see like the definition and the outline. That's just because of how much color went into that paper and different papers are going to break differently. This one happens to be mixed media. So let's just talk about the mica spray. So right now, I don't know if you can see it, but it's really subtle. It has just a, a nice shimmer over the top, but we're going to go in and we're going to add some more. So I'm just going to shake that again. No sludge. Now I've just added a whole nother layer of that. You don't see the mica spray until you dry it. Okay. Okay. There you go. Now we're, this is our second layer. And again, you have to dry it to see it. The mica is not visible until it's dry. Doesn't need to be heat dried. You can wait for it to dry, but now look at the paper. Oh my gosh. Sweet mother of mica. That is beautiful. 
Look at that. And you can tell that the color underneath is not impacted. That's the beauty of a mica spray is it just adds an accent. So this happens to be that brass color over the top of it. So unlike a, a metallic spray stain that's going to cover it, a mica spray just enhances the paper. And this paper is dry, but doesn't it just look so, and so the more you add, the more mica or luminous effect you're going to get. And so if you're doing backgrounds, if you didn't want it as a top layer, you could spray mica spray, you can spray your stains, you can get those to mix at the same time uh, and get something a little shimmery, but I love the effect of that, stunning. Sweet mother of mica. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's just how I am. So I just, I love the effect, it's beautiful. Okay. Moving right along. I have no idea, Tom. I probably don't even want to look because I'm just going to keep going. We'll talk about... No. no. We'll talk about texture. I may not get to everything, but man, I just have fun with sprays. They're just, they're good fun. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just go for a little bit longer because I have stuff to talk about. Okay. So another cool thing is, and I'll just, I'll talk about this briefly. I won't demo this because if you want to see the resist, you guys could uh, check out last Saturday's video. But remember we did the micro glaze resist, right? So we can take this, go through stencil and resist, try this with just sprays. And man, the effect is so intense because you have that fluid movement of that. So I won't talk about micro glaze. I mean, I'll just mention it, but I won't demo it. All right, next we're gonna talk about texture paste. This is important. You can try a lot of different paste. And my advice to you is any kind of dimensional paste that you have, try it see how it works because even in the lineup of textures that i have with ranger whether that's texture paste whether that's grit paste whether that is crackle paste right texture paste crackle all of them react with sprays completely different okay so you might have one that's going to work perfect you might have one that is going to work better and you might have some that don't work and so i just want to talk about uh, this particular one so texture paste matte is designed for fluid mediums it is designed that when it's applied to a surface and it's dry, it will actually absorb a colorant like paper. So that is why Ranger formulated this texture paste. Not all texture paste are created equal and some matte texture paste you go to use and they stay white or very light color because they don't want to absorb the color because of what's in it. But the Distress Texture Paste Matte will absorb color exactly like the paper. So I'm gonna show you how that works. So first we're gonna take our texture paste right and normally i mean like when i'm working with it i use press and seal over the top but i took it off just for the sake of the demo it was easier uh, than last time so we're going to take a again a tag could be a piece of paper it could be anything we're going to take a stencil and we're going to apply it now if if you're a stenciler that again you're a little uncomfortable about how things move well we know the secret to that let's clean that with a little bit of water we're going with a paper towel real quick now i feel like i'm in like a speed round for the demo but I have so much to show you. Okay, so if I wanted to, I can take my sticky grid, put that back down on my clean glass, place that there, place my stencil down, take my masking tape, take a piece of that, place my stencil where I want it, and line it up. Now, if you don't wanna do this, you don't have to, so I'm not, because I'll just show you. Uh, one of the, the cool things about working with texture paste, but just know that you can do that. If that makes you feel comfortable, go for it, okay? But if you place this down, now I'm gonna work with this palette knife, right? This little, I call it like a sports car, because I love the angle of this one versus a long one when I'm applying paste through a stencil. I'm going to take my texture paste and I'm going to work from the back of the palette knife, right? So I'm not scooping it like a spoon, it's on the back of it. Then what I wanna do is once my stencil's in place, my first application is going to be pretty much in an area that I want texture, okay? If you want it all over, then I guess it doesn't matter where you start. But like, let's say I just want to go in a corner. I'm going to press it so you can see I'm holding onto the stencil. Even if I had tape, I would because I want my stencil to be a flat. But once you press that down, so I pressed it kind of into the stencil, these have become one. Do you see what I mean? Like you don't have to, the paste actually grabs onto the stencil. So as long as you're holding both, it's okay, right? You don't need to always worry about uh, taping things down. But again, you do you. Do what makes you comfortable working with it. I just like to explain like why I tape things down and why I don't because it really just depends on the medium. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at my stencil. So if your stencil has a big opening like right here, I'll hold this up to show you. You see that big opening, that little right there? 
If you go in and you push paste this way, chances are you're gonna shove the medium under the stencil. So you kind of want to follow the direction of a stencil, your design. So like when the line's going this way, well then you should apply paste this way, right? When a line goes this way, we're going to push in with that line, right? Not against it. Now when I'm applying paste, here's the things that you need to remember when we're adding texture. If you just put it on like you're icing a cupcake and you lift this up, the dismount is not going to be pretty because all of that paste is going to come up through the stencil and fall right back into your paper. It's just going to collapse. So when we apply paste, we're going to spread it around, right? Wherever we want to put it. You can kind of see that it's just, it's gliding over the surface. But if I can't see the design, you see how I can't see my stencil? That's too much, too much paste. And it's not going to give you a nice clean look. So that's why we want to use that straight edge of the knife to just go in and just scrape over that. Now, this is why I like a palette knife that is plastic and somewhat flexible because to me, a metal palette knife and a plastic stencil really don't get along, right? It tends to grab my stencil too much and almost fold it over or rip. So I spread the paste and skim the paste, spread, skim, right? So I'm not going in digging it out. I'm not sitting there like with a gift card trying to use it as a squeegee. I'm just using the knife and that has that flexibility yet rigidity is what I love about the knife. Then when I'm done, I can scrape all that back in cap it up, you know, put your press and seal, whatever you're going to do. And now before I lift it off, you can see that I can see my design, right? It's clearly still covered in a, a paste, but I can see the detail of it. And then just like before, hold the stencil. Don't just sit there and lift it off, hold it somewhere, pick this up. And we're just going to peel right through that paste. Now this goes right into the water and all of that paste, everything on it literally dissolves with water because it is a water soluble medium. All right. So here's what we have. Take a look at that. See, look at the detail in there. Isn't that cool. That's what's great about texture paste. Now, how long does this take to dry? Well, it depends on where you live. Um, usually it's probably going to be dry in about 15 minutes. Could be a little longer. A ceiling fan is going to help. Do you apply heat to this? I don't. If you apply heat to texture paste, it will kind of puff up like a marshmallow. Maybe that's your thing and you can do that. That's totally fine. But I like to let mine air dry. And so we prep some, uh, we prep some tags. Now here's the other thing to know about texture paste, right? So this one is dry. You can see that when I apply texture, I like to just be uh, very random because I think that's what adds great texture to a background is just being random, even on a stencil. But here's the great thing. This is completely pliable. So although this is dry, it is still flexible. It doesn't, it doesn't dry crunchy and hard where you can't uh, use it. So if you do any kind of, again, journal, your page will remain flexible. If you work uh, on, you know, on envelopes, Juicy Christian, just the envelopes, you're rocking my world. Um, that's going to be mailable because it's going to stay flexible. But here's the cool thing. Once this is dry, it is now porous. So people say, well, can you tint this? Can you add color to this? Sure. If you wanted to mix up a little color of it, you can put some on your mat. I prefer to color it with paint right? Because paint is going to give it the most intense opaque color, but you could add ink. The problem is if you add too much ink, it's going to get gummy and it's going to lose its texture. So if you're going to color this, uh, try to stick with paint for that. All right. So this one is going to dry. I'll set it aside, usually out of my range. Otherwise it'll be the first one I, I like to grab. And I've textured a lot of different things. Here's one that's got more of an all over pattern. That one's a little skippy. This one, a great stencil. This is kind of a, oh, I love this one. I'm just going to grab it. Oh my gosh, Mario, I told you. There's no reason I would have put these in order because it's never going to stay that way. <laughs> there we go. That's it. So it's a cool, big, crackly uh, background. So let's do some, let's do some sprays, shall we? Here we go. <laughs> I think so. Okay. We're going to flip this. We're going to take this down. So there's one. You got paste. I chose the one that has actually more, more stuff on it, more action. Okay, here we go. So what I want to do is I want to add my colors. Okay, well, which ones do I want? Well, let, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go to town. I know that I want it blended. So we have the technology to blend color on contact. We're going to start with something a little wet, and then we're just going to take our sprays and go for it. Okay, very bright, vibrant colors. I will do a grungy one, so no fear. People are like, oh man, he's lost his edge of grunge. Never, right? But I, th I think that it's fun to see stuff in color, you know? I think it's important to to be open to just trying things. You may not think that you're kind of 
the into vibrant colors until you, oh, I want to go with something different. Let's do peacock feathers. Um, until maybe you try it, right? Then we're going to, you could open up a whole new world of that. All right, let's add that color. Now, as far as oxides go, I'm going to add a little oxide to this one. I'm going to add a little cracked pistachio. Okay. But this one, I'm just going to take this up and I'm just going to use the little schnozzly bit, right? Just to add some drips. So you can always take that out and just kind of flick the top of it and you'll get some splatters. Oxide's just going to give us some really interesting uh, splattery effects when it dries. And with this color, so we're going to go in and dry it with a heat tool. Do you have to add oxide? No. But knowing that we can, we're going to get some really, really cool things. And yes, you can ink over this. So can you use a blending tool over this? Yes, you can. Um, how far away is your sprayer? Um, this far. So probably, well, when I was spraying, I would say about six inches, right? If you're, if you're doing like the drips, probably about 12 inches away. Okay. So it's when you dry it, then you see the magic, right? And the reason everything is blending, why? Because we started with wet paper. Okay. So here we go. So as this is drying, and again, this could totally air dry, nothing wrong with that, can completely air dry. But look at this effect that we're getting. I love it. Get that drip off, get that drip off. I mean, can you believe that? See, and look at those little dots from the oxide. I mean, stop it right now. That's the good, that's the good. I actually think I want even a few more of those, right? So just make sure when you're doing this technique that you always screw the top on when you're done. <laughs> uh, can you use resin over it? No, you can't use resin over distress because it's reactive uh, with water. So if you pour the resin over the top, all your colors will start to react. So it won't. You'll need something, you know, like alcohol ink. You need something permanent. Okay. There we go. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Look, oh, isn't that cool? So all of that, do you see what I mean? Where I said the paste takes on color exactly like the paper, right? That's the cool thing about the Distress Texture Paste Matte is it absorbs the color. We're gonna take it a step further. Next, we're going to take this one and we're gonna go to the grunge side, right? That's gonna be our worn one. So we're gonna start with that. We're gonna take some grungy colors over here. Uh, going to use a little bit of old paper. This is an oxide spray. Old paper is going to be really good. I'll spray some of that down. Old paper has kind of a, a greenish hue like old paper. Uh, that's the color that I really like. And take a little frayed burlap. Frayed burlap stain probably, eh, I would say my favorite, in the fluid stains. Here's a little walnut stain. All right, we're going to do that. I've got sprays everywhere. We're going to do a little speckled egg because why not? And then we're going to add a little bit of blue. I'll just take it a little peacock feathers. Don't want to do too much. And I'm going to take some rusty hinge. Okay. Then I'm going to spray this with a little bit more water. And like I said before, I'm going to move this around. So see, look at those colors. Just, just to get a little bit of, just to get a little bit of movement. Okay, now we're going to go for it. We're going to start drying this up. Okay, move that to the edge. Perfect. Really grungy. I love that. Okay. So uh, someone just asked, what's the difference between grit paste and texture paste? Grit paste has grit. It's gritty. Texture paste is just a puffy texture. So it's somewhat smooth, but grit paste is full on grit. Completely different, so grit paste would not absorb color like this. Grit paste would actually resist the color. Grit paste can be colored with things like crayons and paint, which we'll get to next week when we talk about paint. All right, so see, see that grunge that I'm getting? All right, so now let's actually, let's have a play with this one. We're gonna mop up some of that extra dark color. Look at that oxide. Oh my gosh, you see that? <laughs> Hello, old paper. That's the thing to remember. Old paper has it, it's got a mind of its own in an oxide. Uh, very interesting because it does have these really 
Fred Burlap does something very similar. Old Paper is kind of bluish and Fred Burlap is kind of greenish. So I'm going to dry this because I want you to see how that's going to look when it's completely dry as a background. Now remember the only oxide we used was Old Paper. That blue, that other little bit of blue that went through, that's because remember I did add a little bit of peacock feathers throughout the top so that certainly enhanced the effect of that. Okay. There we are. I'm going to dry that. And could you let this air dry? Absolutely. Okay. I just like to use a heat tool. And remember the tip that I gave with embossing. If you allow the heat to pass through the paper, you will help keep your paper from curling up like a fruit roll up, right? Because if I just dried it this way, the heat's going to rise and it's going to curve the edges of my tag or my paper. So just try to let the heat pass through the paper and that's going to keep something fairly flat, right? Okay. So now we have this, right? Cool background. Great. I love how it took that, but here's the magic of texture paste. Okay. Texture paste not only applies color, but it will also do takesies backsies, right? You can, you can take color back from texture paste. So I'm just going to take uh, a paper towel. I'm just going to miss that. So just, it's somewhat damp and I'm going to place it down. I'm going to press into that textured tag and I'm just going to start lifting. See that color? Look what's happening. What? So could you spray the whole thing? Sure. But I just prefer to control where I want to lift it. And that's just by pressing down a damp paper towel and lifting. And the more you do that, the lighter this is going to get. So that to me is magical about texture paste. Now I'm just going to do my, my drips with the, the sprayer uh, because we can and we'll dry it. But that's the cool thing about texture paste. It applies color. So even, even though it's dry, you can take it back with something wet because remember these mediums are always water reactive. Knowing what you learned last week, distress ink, distress oxide, always water reactive, distress spray stain, distress oxide spray, water reactive because these are fluid sprayable versions of those ink pad mediums. So all the stuff that we do, remember when we flick water on a distressed background and we can lift it off? Well, do the same thing with sprays. But texture paste, this is what I love about Ranger's texture paste. Pure magic because it will take color in the most intense opaque way where it becomes part of your background. And if you ever want to take it back, you can. So even where the water drips were, you see how that became even lighter than when we lifted? Because you can lift this back to white. You can actually lift it back to its core color just by continuously uh, taking water and just lifting it right out. Isn't that a great effect? Such a cool background. Dang. Okay. Another thing we can do with texture paste, all right, is this. This is really cool. Let me see where we are with time. Okay. Not too bad. Not really not as bad as I thought, Mario. I was a little worried. Okay. So here's the next thing we can do with texture paste and sprays. So for this one, get a piece of paper, get a piece of paper out, which is gonna, gonna mess up all the color things, is let's say, yeah, having that white background, it's going to, it'll be fine. I'm gonna take a tag. I'm going to take a stencil. I'm going to take embossing powder, right? Any embossing powder you want. Could you do embossing glaze? Absolutely. So you can do distress embossing glaze. This one happens to be Ranger's gold embossing powder. Ranger makes a bazillion embossing powders, beautiful, beautiful ones. I don't need my paper yet. What am I doing? Okay. But I need it at the ready. My paper is over there. All right. Yeah. They make a lot of really, really beautiful, beautiful embossing powders. Okay. A lot. A bazillion? Bazillion. Is that what I said? Oh, I don't know. But yeah. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Back to our texture paste, palette knife, embossing powder at the ready. It's open scrap paper over here. I'll bring that in in just a second. So I'm going to pick up some of that paste. I'm going to take a stencil, place it down. So you remember once you do that, your stencil is good. So don't worry about it. And I'm just going to kind of press and scrape, press and scrape. There we go. We do a little bit down here. Okay. Take that back in the jar, clean, clean, cap on again I'll I'll seal that up after the demo we're gonna take our stencil gonna hold on to that I like to slide it off the edge of the media mat I do that a lot the media mat sticks up a little bit off the surface it really uh, provides leverage for me because I don't have fingernails we're just gonna lift that off 
Okay, that's gonna go in the water. And then right away, right, as soon as you're done putting on the paste, you are going to cover it with embossing powder. Right, and when I say covered, do you see how I covered it? It's gonna go back in the jar, so don't sit there and, and sprinkle it on. You wanna just really cover this up while the paste is wet. The surface of the paste dries fairly quick. So even though the underside, I'm just gonna wipe off that excess paste. Even though the drying time, as I mentioned, is like 15 minutes or more, the surface gets a skin on it pretty darn quick in probably about a minute or so. So if you don't have these supplies ready and you go and get them, chances are your embossing powder will not stick to the wet paste. Okay, so we cover that. And once it's on there, you're good. Now we can go in, we can take our embossing powder, we can put all that back in the jar, right? Just a piece of copy paper works for that. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to let this dry. How long does it take to dry? Well, same rules apply. But the difference is uh, on regular texture paste, you can touch it to see if it's dry, but on this, you do not want to touch it, okay? You wanna let it dry completely. So I have one over here that I've been doing everything I can during this demo to not set something on top of it because I did this one last night, okay? So this one has paste and dry powder and the powder is on there and it is attached to the paste. However, if I went in and touched this powder, even though my paste is dry, the powder is going to come off because texture paste is not a glue, it's just a wet enough medium to get embossing powder to stick to. Believe it or not, you can get embossing powder to stick to anything wet. And in this case, it was wet. But now that it is dry, I need to emboss it. The reason I need to wait for this paste to dry before embossing is as I mentioned, texture paste, while it's wet and you heat it, will bubble and blister. And so if you try to emboss it while the paste is wet, some of that paste can come up and kind of explode over your embossing like just kind of burst and leave little white marks. So I don't do that, I let that dry. So now I'm going to take an embossing tool. So not a heat tool, take my embossing tool, I'm gonna heat it up, okay? That's what I like. Pick up my tag, and now we're going to emboss it. And I'll just hold it right here so you can kind of see it, there we go. Look at that. Oh my gosh. So what's cool about this is that any of your embossing powders, your embossing glaze, your metallics, whatever, you don't need metallic paste and this paste and that paste. I mean, you can, I'm not going to say you don't need it, but I'm saying you can achieve, yeah, choice of words, Tim, you can achieve the effect of a metallic paste or any color paste for that matter with all of your different embossing powders and glazes. But what I like even more is the fact that if I wanted to paint with powder, like we did during the glaze, you know, we were sprinkling on different colors, I can paint with powder this same way. So it doesn't all have to be gold. I could have done, you know, gold on the flowers and platinum on the stem or whatever that is. But also by putting embossing powder over the texture paste, it is so nuggety bubbly. Oh, hold on, there's one little spot I see when the light hit it different, there we go. It has such a cool effect. Look at that. So beautiful. So we still get the dimension of the paste. We still get the marks from a palette knife, but now they are gilded, right? Because of the embossing powder, right? Whether it's gold or whether it's platinum or whether it's whatever. And now we can go in and add our color. So we can go back to our splat box. We'll add some color to this real quick. This will be beautiful. Okay, let's, let's go in, add a little bit of water. Let me take, there we go. Here's a little, little crackling campfire on that one. We'll save a little evergreen bow. Perfect, now we're gonna add some color with our stain. So good. So, so good. I'm looking for, where is fossil, there we go. It's like, where is fossilized amber? I just kind of look for colors. Let me go into my grunge box. I do love uh, little gathered twigs. It's gonna be a nice, nice brown. It's really good. And there we go. All right, so our embossing is not going to absorb the color like our texture paste did, because remember our embossing powder is plastic, what we learn uh, from our glaze. So I just wanted to blend a little bit of that color 
we'll get rid of this flat box. So you can see how the fluid stain has just beat it up right on top of that embossing powder. Now, will it dry on there? Yes. Will it stay permanent? It will not. So as I'm drying, I'm going to edit that. I'm going to remove those droplets of ink as I do it. Also notice I switched heat tools. The reason I did that is because I don't want to re-emboss this paste, right? If you only have an embossing gun, keep your distance on this step. Uh, the heat tool, it doesn't really like to emboss powder very quickly. So this is going to allow me to go in and, and dry my ink, but also dab off that stain, right? Because if you had an embossing gun, that would be melted again. And if you tried to dab it off, it would stick to your paper towel. So another benefit to really having two different tools to do something a little different. And I do love the punch of color. So you can see kind of the undertone of, of crackling campfire, that really deep part of blueprint sketch and a little bit down here, mermaid lagoon. And then to me, fossilized amber kind of warmed up everything, even the blue. So I'm going to do a little bit of splatter just cause I always love uh, drippage. And even for this one, I'm going to stand this up just to create a different movement. See how we can get that background just to have a little bit of movement. And we're gonna keep drawing this. Mm -mm -mm. So good, right? And this could be something that's just a background. This could be something you could die cut. So if you did a bigger sheet of paper, you can die cut this. If you had a different pattern, let's say you're gonna you know, die cut the new perspective butterfly, you know, you want something that that's just gonna be like super, super impressive, you can do that. Now notice this one, I did not dab up my water droplets because I didn't want that. I didn't want it to look like a galaxy. I wanted just the colors in the back to look more fluid. So those are the ones that we just let dry. But there's our tag, look at that. Now we could go in with ink blending and I would. I would go in with my ink pad uh, and my blending brushes and just kind of add some shadows here and there. But you get the idea. You get the ability of working with uh, the texture paste. And that's what's great about it is that we can use it as a solid colorant, we can use it in lift color, or we can add any embossing powder, including embossing glaze, uh, and emboss it after it dries and then do all of our color. And people might say, well, can you add texture paste over an inked background? Here's what's going to happen if you do that. Let's say we inked a tag green and we put some texture paste on it because we wanted it to be snow. Well, when that texture paste goes onto a surface, is this paste wet or dry? Well done class. Yes. Texture paste is wet. That's what allows us to spread it out. So when you put a wet medium over an inked distressed tag, that's going to react that color. And so the color, believe it or not, starts being absorbed by the paste and your paste will actually take on the color of your background. Very faint, very mild, but just so you know, it's going to take on the color. So if you wanted to keep it white, you would need to seal your background first. You that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> <laughs> I should give you like a cheat sheet, yeah, right? Like, like when you ask this, say yes. yeah, Mar say no. Mario will say this. Okay. All right. I'm going to, let me just see what I have over here. I'll do a couple more things and then we can wrap it up. Not too bad. Really considering all that's here, Mario, I don't think, I don't think I'm going too bad because I do off camera. I've got so much stuff prepped and ready to go. Different embossing like this one. This one has a little vintage platinum. I won't emboss the whole thing, but I just have to show you this color. Oh man my heat tool oh, it's telling me it doesn't want to go okay that's all right i think i burned up my heat tool it will cool that off i'll do this while we're working on that let's talk about these guys okay because one another thing that it's important to remember when you're working is that really no thing is like off limits <laughs> that explains why you got blue snow that would be why yes so if you seal it with microglaze before you put the paste on, that's going to create a barrier and it should not wick as long as you have enough microglaze on your ink background. Okay, so stamps, another tool that many people don't think to use with sprays because you're like, why would I want to, to stamp? I need ink pads for that. No way, you can totally use uh, your sprays for that. So I'm kind of clearing off my little craft space. Here's some of my favorites. I love this uh, grungy one. This is just called grunge because I could stamp a solid area if you're if you're splatter challenged, right? You always try to make a splatter, but you get it everywhere, but where you want it. And by the time you get it, it's bad. Splatter stamps are very cool. Uh, alphabets, little dots, a favorite. I love the floral stamp. I know this is a favorite. Uh, there's, it's just, I know it's a favorite of Stacy's as well. It's just a cool background to work with. Uh, Easter, this is also great. Anything that's going to be kind of uh, solid is gonna be perfect. Springtime shadows. This is gonna make a great plaid. We can even use something alphabet. We can even use something like 
wildflowers. We could even go as detailed as a flourish. So you can take all different levels of stamps. They're just going to give you something different. All right. So let's go with that. Oh, this is another favorite. I use this. I use it a lot for Christmas because this kind of creates that solid background. All right, here we go. We're going to, um, we're going to take, let's see, I think I'll work with this or maybe I'll work with, yeah, let's do this. Let's do watercolor paper because we're going for a watercolory effect. So first thing I'm going to take is a stamp. I'll do a background stamp. So let me take this florally one. <laughs> I always want options because Mario's like, how many things are you making? I'm like, probably not many, but I want options, right? We always want that. Oh my, you should see. It's like coin dozer over here. Everything I pick, I just shove something else out of the way. Okay, putting a stamp down. Um, when I do this, I prefer to use a block for stamping versus a stamping tool because uh, I just wanna be able to go into my ink, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some colors and I've shared this technique a lot because I do, I never tire of it. I think it's, it's always really impressive to, to see. So I'm just going to take some sprays and I will spray some different colors down. Notice when I'm spraying this on the back, on the, the mat, I'm not spraying tons, but I also want to create a little blend when I can. And maybe we'll do a little citron over there. And gosh, let's do a little bit. Hold on. Let's do this one. Let's do a little fire brick over here. See, I just shove everything out of the way. There we go. Okay. Then we're going to take a stamp. Again, watercolor paper. Could be wet or dry. It's up to you. And now we're going to ink our stamp into the spray. So I didn't add any water. I didn't do anything, but I'm just going to go in with my stamp and I'm going to tap that in. Now, if you move everything around, you're going to mix all your colors. So you just want to pretty much stick to where you're going. All right. Then you have some options. One, we can just go in and stamp. Okay. Stamp with purpose because we've got color onto the stamp. That's fine. And that's going to give us a really beautiful watercolor effect. And don't judge this yet. Never judge a watercolor while it's wet because it's always going to look a little mucky and we can do smoother texture. This one, I'm going to go on the textured side. Now I still have stain on here, right? Beauty of stain. Remember, as I mentioned, it is water reactive. So we're going to go in with just some water now because I've already stamped one generation and I'm just going to miss that with water. We're going to do a second generation. So when I stamp on textured paper, the longer you can let it sit, the better kind of impression you're going to get, but we're still going for watercolor. Okay. So this is going to give me a second generation of that. Okay. Same stamp. I'm going to take another piece of paper. Maybe this time I'm going to take white heavy stock. White heavy stock is nice and vibrant and smooth. Perfect for wet techniques. Same stamp. I'm going to spray it again. More water, place it down onto my paper, and we're going to stamp with purpose. And when I say stamp with purpose, it just means hold with one, press with the other, no CPR on your stamp. Just always hold it, press, hold it, press, and then lift that off. There's our third generation. So in the same inking, I'm able to create beautiful watercolor cards. So simple without doing your ink cubes. Now, could you do that? Of course you could. Right. We have the technology. We know how to do that. We can do markers. We can do our mini distress inks. We can spray it with water. But the intensity of a spray, that's what makes it magic. That's why we have sprays. Different art mediums do different things. And this is giving us first, second. And remember, second has water. Third has water. Could we get a fourth? Yeah, probably we could get a fourth and it would be even lighter as we go. Different papers, smooth side of watercolor, textured side of watercolor, uh, smooth, Heavy stock. Now, the, the important thing to remember is that a watercolor always comes into focus when it's dry. Okay. So sometimes you'll stamp and you're like, oh, I hate it. Okay. Just let it dry. Really give it a second to dry because then really believe it or not, things come in focus. It will still be watercolor because we stamped in fluid. It's never going to be as crisp as a, an ink pad, but that's not the effect uh, we're going for. Really? At least uh, I hope not. That, that was the whole idea, but take a look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, all those colors blend and it just has, it just has that kind of, just that movability of, of a watercolor, right? Without a brush and that's on textured paper. So if you ever tried to just stamp something detailed on lumpy bumpy paper by having something fluid, we now have more ink that's going to permeate the surface. And obviously our first generation on 
dry paper, super intense. It's not even dry yet. I'd probably mop that up with a paper towel just to, to lift that off, right? So three different generations of that. We're gonna keep going on that ink though. And we will take another piece of paper. This time I'll go, I think I'll do this white again. No, actually I'll do watercolor because it's, listen, I always think I'm gonna grab a piece of paper, but whatever paper is there, I guess that's when it's saying, no, that's the one you're gonna use. All right, so look at my palette. So here's what I know about my palette. I know that I've already gone through it, through it, but my colors still remain, right? So I could still go in and add maybe a little bit of green over here, a little green and red, right? Cause I want that up there, but then I'm just gonna pretty much stick in this area and we'll see what we get. Now what we're going to do is we're gonna take watercolor paper and we're gonna mist it. So what happens if we stamp on wet paper? Well, we know what we know. What's gonna happen is our image is going to blend on contact. So as soon as we stamp, it's going to wick. It's going to wick into that paper. We're gonna lift that off. There we go. And this is going to be a much more fluid, fluid background. Is it horrible? Gosh, no. It's not horrible at all. It's a totally different one. Would this be the stamp I choose? Eh, maybe not. Maybe I would do this with numbers or maybe I would do it with something a little bit bolder like a flourish, but it's still going to be a very beautiful watercolory background, but it's very watercolory. Why? It's very watercolory because it is wet. We started on wet. So wet on wet is only gonna make it, well, wetter, okay? That's it. So there is our wet paper, but look how that ink blooms and blossoms. And as I mentioned, you know, you you would be choosing paper that, or an image that you're gonna want that look. Actually, I don't think this is bad at all. I think it's really stunning. You know, especially if we put something right in the middle where I think it's the blobbiest, uh, it could be a beautiful, beautiful background. All right, so you get the idea of stamping with stain. Okay, again, on, off, okay. So any kind of background stamp, a nice floral is really good for this. Put that down. But I don't want you to always think it has to be flowers. We'll take this one. This is really great, especially for uh, spring or if you like to create some whimsy effects. This is just called Lumberjack. It's got a, a great kind of linear wood grain and a super fun plaid. Okay, we could take our paper. This will be some mixed media. This time I'll go in with some gathered twigs. We'll also take that spray stain. See now every just everyone came to the party over here. Like the party's over here, we're coming. So I've got I've got oxide, I've got spray stain, I've got a little bit of whatever. Heck, we might just throw in some mica too. Just mica right over that. Why not? Because we can. That's the thing. You never really know what's gonna happen until you uh, play around with it. I'm looking for a green. We'll take some twisted citron. I would have liked a little peeled paint. Ah, oh, here we go. Some frayed burlap. There we go. That'll That'll do it for me. Okay. So this plaid going to take a stamp, just going to go in. Okay. Just kind of tap that in, get some ink on there. And, and I do shake it. Like you see how you can get some drips, right? You can still shake that off, right? Or you can just tap that off, but I'm just going to go for it. Cause I don't mind that it's going to be uh, distressed in some way. Can you do this with clear stamps? Absolutely. There'd be no reason you couldn't. Yes. The answer is yes. Look at that plaid background. Now, you know, I'm going to wet that. So clear stamps would work the same as rubber, but you have to be careful because some clear stamps, if it's a, a photopolymer that doesn't like to take ink, your stain might not transfer to a clear stamp. So I would, I would just try it out, right? Or you could always just try to prime a stamp. So this one I sprayed, this is our second generation. Look at that. Loving this background. See? And I actually like that kind of concentration of, of drips and stains. It's not really cool. A fun effect for working with backgrounds. And you can see that you can just keep going and going and going with different stamps, right? We'll take another stamp. Let me just, I just clean that off with the ink towel. That's as clean as a stamp needs to be, in my opinion. And we'll take this grunge set. Okay, let's take something that's a bit more solid. Okay. Normally I would have a different block, but I'm not going to for the purposes of this demo because this will be fine. Well, I lied. No, I didn't. That's all I got. Okay, I'll use it. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to take this. Normally I would want a stamp block that's relatively the same size as my stamp. You're just going to get better leverage, but we're going to go for it. Okay. Here's a solid one. So watch what's going to happen with a solid. Let's get a little bit more grungy brown in here. Okay. I'm going to press that down. 
What I love about this is that when you first ink up a solid, you don't think you're going to get coverage, but you do because all those little drips press out to the edge. And I think that this is a great way to create like a solid, like let's just say you like to do some mixed media and this doesn't have to be grungy. This could have been pink or blue or anything, but let's say you wanted to stamp this in the middle of a white card. Of course I didn't do it in the middle, but let's just pretend I did. Okay. And then you wanted to put another image in there. Maybe it's a sticker. Maybe it's a, you know, a bunny rabbit, whatever that is. The cool thing about creating an organic edge like this, you know, some people can take a paintbrush and just do that effect. That's what I love about stamps like this that are grungy because I can stamp that and it looks like I did all that mixed media stuff, but I didn't, I just did it all with a stamp. So you can just blot that off and there's your mark ready to go. All right. Same thing with dots or anything like that. So, so fun. Probably one of my favorites here. All right. I've got one more technique to show Mario and then I'll wrap it up. I promise. I do. Keep on, going. keep on, keep it on. <laughs> Just keep on going. All right. So this little spray stain, I think if I'm looking for a color now, I should probably just stay over here because that's where they all seem to be. Okay. A little bit of this and I'm going to do some oxide in here. Yeah. I like this one. This is shaded lilac. It's just a really cool uh, color. Really, really good. All right. So, okay. Check out this stamp. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. So let's just say we had a, just a regular, just distressed background. This one I moved just so you can see. Get that great effect. Oh, so good. Mixed media. So, so good. All right, so let's say you go into stain and you don't want much, go somewhere, right? Go somewhere in your glass. Don't go on a, a piece of scrap paper. Uh, that's not going to work out too well because it's going to pull off most of the color. But see, I was able to get a lighter version of this, even though I inked it. Remember, this wasn't second generation, but you get a little bit more control by just kind of stamping off of that. But what a great pattern. That's the thing to remember about stamps. Stamps are imagery. So when you look at images, think of how you can incorporate those in layers. This could be, again, something in a journal. This could be done in white or anything. All right, moving on. Look at this. Wow. There's a pile going on behind me. That is okay. Let me clean this part up and I'll show you one other thing that I think is a great way to think about stamps. Okay. When it comes to working with stamps as, as textures or backgrounds, layering is important. So you can see the intensity of this that we've stamped. Remember that if we want to get that to become more of our background, we can just spray that with water and that's just going to blend it out. The cool thing about still doing it with a stamp is we get some of that effect, some of that imagery, and we can always dab some of that, edit a little bit, but that still gives us a very cool visual effect. So if you're looking at an image and you wanted to use this as part of your background, first of all, I have a lot of ink drops on there. So I know that if I add water to that, that's just going to make even more happen. So I'll get rid of that first. But if I want some of this to move water, heat, and it doesn't have to be a one-time deal, right? Water, heat. And all this is doing is it's just softening what's there. Now, if I just keep going with water on the bottom there and then I heat dry, a whole different effect. But I just want to show you how you can control this technique by how much water and heat that you add with that. You see that? So this one was just a lot of water and immediately I blotted it off. This one, I kind of kept the top more intense and then I focus more water along the bottom. But see, you would look at that stamp and be like, I would never need that stamp ever. And then you see it and you're like, how have I ever gotten through my creative day without a stamp like that? That to me is what you need to understand always about stamps and, and stencils. You might even have stamps already in your stash that you can utilize for techniques like this that maybe they aren't even your favorites. That That's also kind of a cool thing is just Take something grungy. You could stamp an alphabet like that. You could do so many great things uh, working with 
sprays. And I think that's the important part. And the opacity, remember, is coming from oxide. So if you're using sprays, oxide spray, spray stain, very important. Okay, let's do this one and then we'll wrap it up. Because this is one that I asked myself, what if I did it? And I was like, I like this. So we've seen spraying backgrounds with stain. We've seen watercoloring with stain. We've seen stamping with stain and stenciling with stain. And then we saw texture paste. And so of course my popcorn brain is like, hmm, I wonder if I could take a stencil and I've embossed with everything from ink to dabbers, to paint, to oxide, to water. And I'm like, can I em emboss with a spray stain? Can I just take a spray and emboss it? And the answer is yes. So this background, as you can see, is embossed. But do you see all those little speckly fleckly looks? Yeah? All those little pits of pigment? That wonderful dynamic dye. See, I could just go on and on with those little verbiage. But all of those, you, you can see, yeah, they all those little dots where it looks like it's wet, but it is not. It is embossed like that. That is all because even the embossing powder grabs onto the spray the same way the spray is the spray. This to me looks like that little party mix of sprinkling with powder, but this my friends is done with spray stain. And here we go. So what I'm going to do is I will take a stencil. I will take a tag. What did I say? Can you find anything? Pick, no, I can't. You need help finding I just, them? yeah, I had a whole stack of, I, look, I even took this whole stack of tags and threw them on the table over there. What is wrong with me? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm going to take this one. It's just how it is, right? That, that's just how I am. All right. So I'm going to create a, uh, an effect, a spray effect. So let me get my splat box also buried over here in the background. And the important thing that I've learned when you do this technique is less is more. Okay. So we'll take a tag. Now my tag needs to make sure that my stencil could somehow lay on this. Could you go in and uh, add things to it? Meaning, uh, could you, could you tape it down? Sure. In fact, like on this one, Paper doesn't have a memory, so I just want my tag to be a little bit flatter, which will help my stencil go on it. Let's flip it this way. Ah, that, ah, that's a better contact for me. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm positioning my stencil where I've got a little overhang around there. Can you see that? I've got a little bit hanging around. And then I'm going to choose my spray colors. And just like I did with the texture paste, I'm going to want to make sure that my embossing powder is ready and my piece of scrap paper is ready. Okay, I hope that turns on. Do you think it's gonna turn on? I don't know, do you wanna test it? Oh, there we go, okay. Just needed a cool down period. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take our sprays. Now, this time, as I mentioned, less is more. We don't want this to be super juicy because I think if you do that, you kind of lose the spray effect. Because, you know, like anything, anytime you, have a new technique, you try a million and one ways to ruin it or to do it again, it could go either way. So here we go. I'm gonna take the spray and I'm just gonna go across with little mists of color. Okay, let's do a little bit more of that. We'll go in with a little bit of yellow. Perfect, we're gonna go in with just a little bit of blue. All right, I'm gonna take this off. Remember, hold the stencil, lift this. Yes, I would want to make a print. I would want to do all those magical things. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to cover this with clear embossing powder. Just clear. You see, I'm pretty generous with the clear. And that's going to, well, it does a couple things. One, it coats the stain. Two, it absorbs the stain. And I'm going to just tap off the excess. Another thing that really surprised me is I thought for sure with all that wet color, surely it's going to color my embossing powder. And it doesn't. The embossing powder is stuck right to that. So I'm going to set this down. But here's what you need to know. Everything we know about stain is going on right now, meaning the longer that that stain is sitting on the paper, the more it's wicking out. The more it's wicking out, the more it's drying. And because it doesn't have any glycerin or anything like that, if we let this dry like we would texture paste, all of our powder would fly away as soon as we emboss it. So for this technique, you need to heat emboss it right away. Okay, so even if you wanted to make that print, that print can wait. Now this is about getting the powder on, getting the powder off, and embossing it. Now when you emboss this, it's going to take a little bit longer than traditional embossing because we're doing two things. One, 
we are drying that stain underneath and we're also embossing let me there we go don't be a flicker just tap it okay i saw an excess wad of powder all right and you can see the color just really coming to life just popping but i'll show you what i'm talking about with with the whole speckles Go down there, make sure that's embossed. Beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna turn it around because I'm embossing the other side. So another tip when you're embossing and you're holding, don't ever emboss toward your hand. Just emboss away from your hand. That's gonna keep you from burning yourself more than you should. And see how quick, like once it goes, it goes. Once your embossing gun is up to speed, it just goes for it. Okay. Let's make sure that, there we go. Melted, melted melted and that's all we're doing we just want to make sure that everything that we've covered is in fact not just dry but also melted i'm tipping it to the light because i can see you know where my powder is melted and where it isn't there we go let's go to this side to see a little matte space over there it's interesting you know when you watch it because it kind of fools you you think oh it's done and then it was just about drying the stain all right so good there we go so here's what we have. Take a look at that. Perfectly embossed. But all of those dots, see? See those little, I love them. I love the spray. And I also love, see that wispiness? Because it was a spray. So when I sprayed this way, some of that overspray went under the stencil. But even that overspray caught the embossing powder. So it doesn't have to be super wet, wet like you think because it's going to pick that up. And then you just have options of what to do for your background. You know, you can leave it like that. We can add uh, a totally different color to our background, right? We have this. See, we still have this. This didn't go anywhere. So let's do something with that. Okay, let's take that, take that, take that. I sprayed both, flip it over, place it down. That'll be good. Ooh, yeah. And then we're gonna take this, press it down just to get some of that, get that ink out of there. All right. I just want to make sure I get a good print of this one. All right. So I'm still gonna just bray through that paper towel. Mm mm mm. Look at that. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. Okay, this one goes in the bath. Perfect. And we're going to go back to this one. So this guy, we're just going to add a background. So I'm going to stand my splat box up. I'll use the same paper towel, but I, I want to create kind of a striation background blend. So here I'll just spray that with a little bit of water. This one's already been embossed, so I don't have to worry. I'm going to do some speckled egg there. I will also do a little frayed burlap if I can find it. There we are. Okay, I'm going to add that. Okay. And I'll even go in with, hmm, I think I'll do some walnut because I do, I like a little bit of that dark color. All right. So there's our background now, sprayed. Get the splat box out of the way. Wow, huh? That's something. And now we're going to dry. Yep. Now we're going to dry. So now I'm switched to the craft tool because now I can go in, like I said, and edit without worrying about it because it, Again, it's just going to beat up the same way it did on that metallic. Mm -mm -mm. Little speckled egg, little frayed burlap. So beautiful. And I can still just add a little water just to get some movement. Take that off of the embossed area. Love the little edits. That it's all about okay so we're just going to dry this and you'll see that the ink really dries nice into that tag you can always go back and add more you can certainly go in if you didn't want to do a spray for your background you could go in with your blending tools but now i can just take that and get rid of those little those little dabs of color over the top look at that what a cool and see you still get the shine from that embossing powder that's on there but your color 
it's absorbed in. And because this was embossed, all of our colors were protected. That's why when I first did it, it's just really, to me, it's super dramatic. The darker you go, you know, it's like in school. Remember as a kid, you would, you know, color something with crayons and then you'd cover it with a black crayon and scrape away and, and reveal all the different tones. That's what kind of this reminds me of is that contrast, that heavy contrast of color. So sky's the limit. You know, this could just be, uh, obviously we've been doing a lot of different rainbow blends and colors because I think the more color I can demo, the more uh, hopefully it will catch somebody's style. But you could easily do this for snowflakes, right? You could emboss those snowflakes with, with say, a, a, a light glaze, you know, maybe speckled egg embossing glaze uh, with a, a speckled egg stain. And then your background color is darker blues or purples or you get the idea, but just fun to show you the variation. So that's just kind of, there's even more to demo, but I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up because it, it really just kind of, you're going to wrap it up, but you know why? Because you're out of room. Well, I am out of room, but it's just very cool to show you uh, the importance of working with not only uh, spray stains, but also oxide. And yeah, I'll just start throwing things in a pile because when you see really all the backgrounds we did from metallic to texture to rainbow to Meyer, there's a pile of them everywhere, like everywhere across. Like remember that ombre we did earlier or that, that print, that mono print collection there, or we've done all of our different stampings or we did our embossing or we did our Brayard stain or we did our stencil stain or we did our stencil mono print or we did our watercolor or we were just blending the two of stains and all that. A lot of stuff. Stains, sprays are your friends. Sprays really are something it's just worth exploring. And yeah, there's no doubt you're going to get inky. That's that's the whole point of this. But I don't think you should fear the spray because I think that they can achieve different effects, especially when you combine oxide sprays with spray stains than your ink pads. Again, it's all about vibrancy, intensity and a more uh, fluid look. So with that, that was a lot of good fun. I thought that I thought it was really cool.